ahead and get started. Um, tonight we are going to hold a brief board meeting as well as our public hearing regarding boundary changes and then we will go into um, our work study piece. So Dr. Thomason, roll call. President Reese, members of the board, please let the record show that we have all five board members here on Valentine's Day and we thank you for your incredible dedication and support to the district on this special day. Thank you. All right, we're going to have our moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. going to go on to the approval of the agenda. I move that we approve the agenda. Second. Any questions or comments regarding the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries 5-0. At this time, we're going to recess our board meeting um, for the purpose of holding a public hearing on the proposed Centennial Elementary and Power Ranch Elementary boundary change uh, for the 2018-19 school year. President Reese, members of the board, at this time I'd like to invite Josh Crosby up to the podium to uh, go over the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, for our public hearing. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Josh. Welcome, Mr. Crosby. At this time, the meeting, uh, like I said, will recess for the purpose of holding a public hearing on the proposed Centennial Elementary and Power Elementary boundary change for the 2018-19 school year in accordance with ARS 15-341.A.37. Members of the audience are invited to make comments and ask questions during the public hearing. We will have a presentation on the proposed boundary change and questions and comments regarding the proposed boundary change. Um, and if anyone has questions throughout, we can uh, address those as well. President Reese, members of the board, Dr. Thomason and cabinet members. Uh, back in 2017, I began the process of reviewing ways uh, to improve efficiency for the transportation department within the Higley School District. Um, this included looking at bell times, fleet replacement, life cycles, walkers and riders, as well as school boundaries. On December 4th, I gave a presentation to the cabinet with a wide variety of options um, for changes. After discussion and bringing additional people to the table, it was decided to bring forward this proposal, which you saw on January 17th and again tonight. Um, a couple notes from the last presentation I gave, I did update the numbers so they were current as of today, and I did remove the sixth graders from the numbers as they will be graduating in seventh grade. Um, we also, there was a question at the end of the last meeting um, regarding that red area that we'll get to of where all those students attend school-wise, whether it's Power Ranch, Centennial, Coronado, et cetera, and I have added that data as well. So what we're looking at um, is the red area on the map. Um, it's currently um, zoned with the purple section, which would be Centennial. So the red area is the um, area and the students that would be affected by this change. Um, in that area, 
there are 101 students who attend Centennial, and those they would be affected by the change. Of those 101 students, 77 of them are eligible bus riders. The remainder of them are walking currently to Centennial using the tunnel underneath Germain Road. There are 91 other students living in the red area, which is Centennial, um, and they should be going to Centennial, but they choose to attend another school. 55 of them are attending Power Ranch already. Um, that just added some errors of where our schools are. So you can see the proximity of Coronado and Power Ranch um, to the neighborhood we're looking at. Uh, this is the proposed uh, boundary that I'm recommending. Um, it just simply follows Germain Road being the dividing line between the two um, boundaries. This would eliminate one to two buses um, from serving those schools, and we would be able to reallocate them to other schools with growth to um, ultimately save on the number of buses we need to purchase for the growth in our district. Um, a little bit of history is I believe that red section that we were looking at was drawn um, originally to be Power Ranch and then changed at some point to go to Centennial. And so this would correct that. So once again, this is just kind of a recap. Um, another thing that benefits the school district is the enrollment numbers. Um, Centennial is currently has an enrollment of 878 students while Power Ranch has 556. Um, obviously, we don't know how many would choose to enroll at the other school, um, but if they did, it would help balance the numbers at 752 and 682 would be our projection. It would be a difference of 70 students between the two schools. And then lastly, this is um, a breakdown of just that area in red, and we've got the grades kindergarten through five. Again, I eliminated the sixth graders, and it shows you which schools they're currently attending as of today. So you can see 101 are at Centennial, um, 55 are already choosing to attend Power Ranch, and then there's just a scattering of some other schools here. And with that, I can answer any questions or... So prior to Centennial being built, um, clearly all those were Power Ranch, right? If they were built and um, lived in at that point, yes. Okay. And then Centennial came on. And then Centennial, and then mm -hmm. sometime after Centennial came is when we selected or that group. Correct, or when Centennial opened. Okay. Um, I believe it's been that way since Centennial opened. Thank you. Mr. Crosby, what's the um, operating cost of one to two buses per year? You know, that's what the savings is. What's, what amount would that be saving to the district? Um, you're gonna save in man hours and in fuel and wear and tear. Um, it's hard to say, you're just kind of looking at the driver's salary. I think the larger savings to the district is the fact that those two assets, um, pieces of equipment can be used in other locations. So what would be the cost? Let's say we, we don't do this and we have to purchase two additional buses. What's the cost of two buses? Uh, roughly $150,000 a piece. Mr. Crosby, thank you for bringing this to us tonight. Um, one of my questions is, Currently, you were talking about the walkers that use the tunnel. Of those kiddos that are walking, are any of them crossing Germain Street right there at Germain and Power, or Ranch at House. Um, Ranch House? Are they crossing that street and not utilizing the tunnel currently? Um, I don't really have a solid answer for you one way or another. I, I would be willing to say that there are some riding their bikes that would come straight down Ranch House. Mr. Crosby, also, can you maybe explain a little bit? Um, you indicated how, I'm sorry, I think it was 101 students. Our information is. Um, 
the, the slider to always go to the right. Left. So you indicated 101 students right now this would impact, but only 77 of them are eligible writers. Can you perhaps explain why, what the difference is on what makes them eligible and not? Yeah, there, there are some that regardless of where their home is, is still within one mile with the tunnel or one mile of power ranch. So there's no bus provided either way for the, those students. They're on, they were on the right side of the map. So this, um, this area here, we do not have any bus stops in. So that's where that group of students that's going straight up um, through the tunnel to. But, but that's located right there by the tunnel, because if right. I'm correct, it's this hard is the to tunnel see right our map. Yeah. yeah, yes, thank you. Seeing this is a reducing to this matter in reference to buses because the number of a hundred doesn't seem like a lot to me. So I'm just kind of concerned why are we having this conversation at this point? Is it just you know the two bus issue or where we? Sh I, don't um, know. I think it originally started um, when we were asked to bring cost savings items um, to the cabinet and, and to the board, and this was one of them that that went through. It would save transportation from capital money on purchasing buses, as well as um, essentially two drivers that we would not have to hire because they could be reallocated for other growth. And it also is kind of fixing an error that probably should not have um, been boundaried that way. All of our other boundaries are pretty clear and precise, and this is the only one where we're splitting um, neighborhoods when there's two schools closer to them that they could uh, possibly choose. And Mr. Crosby, Crosby, I'm sorry, did you have more? Um, I understand um, part of this, but why wasn't some of this allocated towards or proposed towards Coronado? Why was that not um, on this proposal at all? Um, the biggest factor, um, in my opinion, why we chose to leave it out is Coronado's on a different feeder school system, so you would be disrupting them through their middle school and high school as well. The students that we're talking about, they do have the option to stay at Centennial. Yeah, this proposal um, would allow them to stay at Centennial. It's just eliminating the busing portion. Um, they could also enroll at Power Ranch or Coronado has open enrollment if they choose to go there as well. So really they have three options, but between all three of them, there would be no transportation provided. We did have some requests from the audience. Um, Michael Grandy, did I say it right? Okay. Um, can we get him a microphone? Thank you, Mrs. Reese. Thank you, President and board members and superintendent and Mr. Crosby. I appreciate all you do for Higley Unified School District. Um, I am a, a parent of some children Ten Centennial, and um, I had some concern. I saw the announcement about the potential change to the school boundaries. Um, my first concern was about the announcement itself. Um, it seemed to, at first read, not to pass the smell test of, is this what's the issue that's really being addressed here, and. That's a sentiment that many of my neighbors shared when they read the announcement. They were just kind of like, what? This isn't going to correct what the announcement says it's about. It uh, doesn't mention anything that Mr. Crosby said about, you know, he was looking at ways to improve efficiency and, and you know, we could get rid of two buses. None of that is in this announcement. Instead, it's framed as 
So that's first one, it'll allow students to attend their neighborhood school. Well, we have open enrollment here, so they can already do that without any boundary change. They can pick whatever school they want to go to. Two, eliminate the need for students to cross a busy street. And with the tunnel on the east side of Ranch House Parkway and, and busing to the students on the west side of Ranch House Parkway, south Hear me all right? Uh, so where it says to eliminate the need for students to cross a busy street, I am not aware of any students crossing Germain because of the bus and the tunnel. There, there may be the occasional one who, you know, like Mr. Crosby said, wants to ride his bike and take his chance. Uh, but um, you know, that statement doesn't quite seem accurate. And then serve to balance student enrollment and I think the answer to that one is, well, is that my three minute time limit? They're telling me I'm done. <laughs> All right, um, so the last one was allowing, you know, it serves to balance student enrollment and I'll get into why I have some concerns about that, but my, one of my main concerns about this whole announcement is, you know, nothing in here says two buses are going to be removed. Nothing says that the main reason for doing this is we're looking at trying to you know, reduce costs or at least reallocate those costs to other places that are needed. So it seems like a bait and switch um, to the average resident that I've talked to and that does not engender trust and transparency with what the school district is, is doing. Um, and then to top it off, there's no contact information on the announcement anywhere. So if you have a comment, your, your only chance if you just read it literally is to come to the public meeting tonight, which I'm glad there's a public meeting. Uh, that, that's a good first step, but you know, I've been to public meetings for other things and all the announcements I can ever remember have some kind of contact information, a name, or email, phone number, if someone wants to provide a contact. So, you know, in the, moving forward in the future, I would just like to see announcements that really hit on the issue at, at hand that allows people to be able to tell better, you know, where they stand on the issue and, um, and helps you as well to know um, what you're voting on. And, and then I would also recommend a policy that you know, all public announcements of this nature that um, have some kind of contact information on them. I just wanted to get back a little bit to why I don't think the en enrollment will change significantly if buses are removed, at least for the section west of Ranch House Parkway. Um, for many of the children in this area, it's more than a mile to Power Ranch Elementary, um, up to uh, almost 1.3 miles for some of the children there. And I'm talking to Dr. Thomason, you know, the kind of general rule of thumb for the school is a one mile radius. And I understand the reason for the one mile radius is it's easier to map. But I think the intent there is that children more than a mile away are not very likely to walk or bike to school. And here we have almost a whole neighborhood that is a mile or more away from the school, although not the way the crow flies, but if you follow the street network, um, you know, there's some, there's a, a part or a future condo vacant lot that, you know, that's fenced, you can't cross that and things. So it's more than a mile to get to Power Ranch. So as a parent, if I'm gonna have to drive my kid to school anyway, why would I s disrupt them and move them to a different school? I might as well dr keep driving them to, to Centennial. Um, and I can't promise that if 
buses remain in Power Ranch, or remain uh, to serve the, the Arbors community, that everybody would switch, but it would definitely help with that, trying to balance the enrollment, um, if that really is an issue of, of trying to, to balance that enrollment number. East of Ranch House Parkway, you know, um, is already very close to our ranch elementary, and there are already many parents who have, through open enrollment, go to Power Ranch. And the ones that go to Centennial are already walking their kids to Centennial. So they'll probably continue to do that, although, again, they're free to go to switch to Power Ranch if, if they wish, but this boundary change isn't going to force that issue at all. Um, so I, so I don't see a, a large shift in enrollment, at least not in the next few years. You know, uh, as new people move in, if the boundaries have changed, then yeah, they'll probably you know, figure out a way to go to the um, to the school that's that they're assigned to. But it, uh, back to to your um, question about you know, is there an urgency here? You know, are we trying to balance out the school enrollment because of overcrowding or you know some issue like that? And and I'm not seeing that urgency for, for why this proposal needs to happen right now from an enrollment standpoint. Um, and then I think the real issue here is on the financial side. As Mr. Crosby mentioned, there's some growth in the northern part of the district and looking for ways to, to address that. And I welcome that discussion and I recognize this proposed boundary change and removing the buses is one potential solution, but I'm sure there's others, and getting to understand and view those different options is something I'd like to see you know, put out to the public before any decision is made on, you know, should we do this boundary change or not, because really this is a, an issue about finances, you know, about how to make best use of the tax dollars that we have. And you know, there's a lot of different ways you can cut costs, move things around. You could you know, change some of the programs from one school to a different one. You know, the accelerated learning program that's at the bridges now is, you know, seems to be very popular. But my understanding is students are bused from their home school to the bridges as part of that. You know, are, those, are there a couple buses there that you could free up and tell parents, you know, if you want to take advantage of that kind of accelerated program, you're going to have to drive your children. That's what happened with the self-contained gifted program when it was at Centennial. Parents living outside Centennial you know, were responsible for driving their own kids there. And most of them did because they were motivated by a, a reason to go to that additional school and they were willing to, to sacrifice and, and drive. So that's just one example. I think there's others, other options of you know, how could we get those additional buses that are needed. So I just wanted to kind of wrap up um, a, a couple statements from a, a letter that hopefully you all got a copy of. I don't know if you had a chance to, to read it or not. But he said, I, I believe the proposed boundary change should be implemented. If it is implemented and no bus service is provided for the Arbor's neighborhood, the desired shift in enrollment from Centennial to Power Ranch will likely not be realized. What you will have to show for it all is a bunch of irate Centennial parents, minimal changes in enrollment at Power Ranch, and reduced student safety, as riding buses is safer than walking a 1.3 miles or driving. Um, you may have some happy Cooley Station families. Uh, you know, his kids get to use buses now, um, but it's at the expense of the Arbor's families. But the real issue here seems to be a financial matter related to having enough buses to meet the transportation demand, not an enrollment matter. So I recommend that you bring this issue to the forefront by conducting a thorough and transparent analysis of the advantages and disadvantages of different potential alternatives for addressing the, uh, the financial concerns and getting public input on those alternatives before making a decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
I'd like to see the letter that he got to receive. I don't have it with me at that time, but they sent it to the parents. I don't have it with me today, please. Rachel Humphreys. Sorry, I saw a light. I thought it was on. <laughs> Anyways, sorry. I've done a lot of data analysis with my job, too, and I understand financials, and I understand all of that. However, as it comes as a parent, financials don't mean anything to us. I bought my house with the fact that I wanted my daughter to have stability that I never had. She's in the fourth grade now, so she will be in the fifth grade next year. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice, sorry. But um, she's gone to Centennial since she was in kindergarten. She has her best friend. They only had one year where they weren't in the same class together. Her dad lives on the other side of the, power, of the boundary line, so I know that she will be going to Centennial again next year, and she won't be going. Then you're saying that my daughter won't be going, or I'll have to find a way to get her there. I don't want her to walk. Walking is dangerous, and I don't think that that should be something that should happen, but that's something that my daughter would have to do so that I could get to work, so that my husband could get to work on time. Excuse me. Um, However, um, she lives, we live 1.1 mile away from Power Ranch Elementary and 1.3 miles away from Centennial. So either way, is she going to have to walk to Power Ranch Elementary? Because that's a street that I also don't want her to cross because Ranch House Parkway is almost as busy as a major street, especially in the mornings when all of these people are trying to go to work. And then if you're going to talk about, I won't disenroll my child from Centennial. I won't. I'll find a way to make her get to school. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been to the drop-off line in Centennial, but it's horrible. <laughs> so now you're also talking about, let's say 50 people decide to keep their kids in that school. That's 50 more cars that you're going to have in that drop-off line and that pickup line that you don't have right now. And just as child safety, I think that that would be astronomical because now you're going to make parents late, so they're going to be rushed and they're going to make bad decisions while they're driving. And that's something that I wouldn't want to see either. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Kim? I didn't want to butcher your last name. <laughs> Kwong, okay. Hello, everybody. I'm a little nervous. I didn't think I was going to be. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, you guys have the best school districts. Um, happy that both my daughters are attending. Uh, they're A students. Um, I'm just very happy that I'm able to give them the stability um, at Power Ranch um, quickly, basically. Um, one of my biggest concerns is obviously, like with most parents, safety. I'm a single mom, and so it's hard for me um, to pick her up um, from after school. I also work for um, education. Um, I work for a community college. And so um, my hours are very um, long and expensive, and I work in Tempe. So it's hard for me to commute. Um, I think the biggest issue is um, the bus ride. I, I have no problem of her going to Power Ranch or anywhere like that's close by. I mean, I think it's just how come Power Ranch doesn't have a bus? And that's the biggest issue. If you guys have that, I'm sure other parents don't mind, you know, having their kids go to Power Ranch because there's nothing wrong with that school. It's just my biggest worry is having her to walk that distance. I mean, it's just, you know, just the road is very quiet. And, I mean, I, I often drive by there just to go to the groceries, and I just, I would be so worried at work thinking that she's walking home in that long distance. So I'm hoping that, you know, um, we can find a way to make this work. 
whether it's a budget or just use that bus to um, for the power to have two. Um, another thing is she's is like really worried because she's going to miss out all her friends. Uh, she's been with Centennial for so long. She has one more year before she goes to Sossaman. And um, she has this good relation with her teachers. She's um, always talking about them, and she's writing books with them. And I just don't really want to move her um, just from that. Um, she's actually the one that's very worried. So she told me, Mom, you have to go to this meeting. You have to do this for me. So that's why I'm here tonight. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Heather Hester. So I'm not familiar with this process at all, and I've never attended any of the meetings, but I came today similar to the woman that just spoke. Um, I'm a mom. My children are in the back. You can see them here. My daughter is at Centennial. She's a first grader. However, my older daughter went to Centennial as well, and she's now 20 years old and at ASU. And there's principle to the fact that I'd like my children to stay in the same school. Um, when Sophia started at Centennial, People knew her as Gabrielle's little sister, and she liked that, and the teachers knew her, and there was teachers that had been there since my older daughter was there. Um, I really want you to consider what we're giving up here, because I understand that there's the concept that you can opt out and go to Centennial, but you are asking for parents to make a financial obligation or some type of change. So. I am a working mom, and I'm usually running from one place to the other, like most people. My husband is a paramedic who works 24-hour shifts. So he, when he's on shift, he's gone, and that's the way that it is. But my options are the bus. The bus, I live on Mariposa. The bus comes right in front of my house. I know that my child's safe. I know that the bus driver has looked out for Sophia in the past, and that's important. I don't want Sophia to not be able to go to Centennial, but I also have no reason to send her to Centennial if I have to figure out transportation wherever I go. And I think that's just a really unfortunate thing. We moved into this district when my daughter was younger, my older daughter was younger, so that she could go to the Higley School District and that she could go to Centennial when it initially opened. And to now have to say, okay, I have to take my daughter out of Centennial because we don't have a bus, when she just worked very hard on her fun run and raising $20,000, and she literally comes home and says, maybe we can buy a bus. And that's hurtful because it doesn't make any sense. And I can't look at her and say, yeah, these buses cost $150,000. We just earned 20000 but you have to go to Power Ranch, and you have to walk, and you're still little, and there's still a lot of issues there. So I just, you know, there's, I know with every decision that you make, it's going to affect somebody, but there's parents in the Arbors community that rely on that bus, and in our reality, you know, there's the option of kids club. Kids club costs money. So there's going to be some kind of financial impact because I don't have a situation where I can drive my children to school. It's not even an option for me. So I have to figure out how they're going to get there. And I just really want you to consider that there's real people and kids that don't want to move their school. They don't want to leave their, their, their friends. And in our family, we really wanted to keep our children at the same school. This same boundary situation happened when our oldest was at Centennial, and she was already going to Williamsfield. And then the boundary change came, and she was told that she should go to Higley. And she was already going. And again, we had to drive her. We, have this, we received the same letter. Well, you can opt out, but you're not going to have the bus. 
so we opted out because she was already in that situation. But this, this shouldn't happen that frequently to boundaries. It's like it's, there's not enough change to say in your ch child's career of education, they're not going to be able to stay on the path with their friends and with the teachers and with the schools that they want to be part of. I don't think that's, I don't think my family should have to do it again. It seems really unnecessary. When I was a child, you had a path of schools you were going to go, and you could count on that happening. So I just want you to consider that this has happened to us before, and I really would rather it not happen again. And I really don't want to take Sophia out of Centennial, but I'm not a parent that has an option to drive. And she likes the bus, and there's got to be some other way financially to figure this out um, because I think so much of it just comes down to that. So please consider it. Please think of the families. Please think of the kids. Please think of the path that they want to take and stay on and not have to be moved around. Thank you. Robin Roginsky, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paige. Um, I have two daughters, 13 and 11. We just moved here from South Florida four years ago, and both of my daughters started going to Centennial. Loved it. It was hard enough to move. But when we got here, they hit the ground running, made friends, went to Centennial. Couldn't have been better. Didn't miss a beat. My older daughter is now at Sossman Middle and loving it. And my younger daughter is in fifth grade. She has one more year at Centennial. And she also likes to be known as Bridget's little sister, which is great because that doesn't normally happen with siblings. Currently, my younger daughter walks from, we live in the groves. She walks through the groves to the Arbor bus stop to already catch that bus to go to Centennial to be there because that is where she has made her friends. That's where she has established her roots since we got here. Taking away that bus, which is the only way that she can get to school, would be terrible for her. She came here, she is happy, she's establishing herself. I am a Gilbert Public School teacher. I teach at Campo Verde High School. We have Quartz Elementary right next to us, okay? I could put her there. I could walk her to school every day, but I don't want to. She doesn't want to. She wants to stay at Centennial. Of course, it would be easy. I could walk her to school every day. I could go to her activities during the day, have somebody watch my class, and that would, as some people think, would be ideal. But I don't want to take her out of that situation, the situation that she enjoys, which is being at Centennial, no matter how convenient it might be, because she enjoys school. She enjoys her teachers. And to take that away from her, I wouldn't want to spoil it, so to say, for middle school, junior high, I think we call it here in Arizona, or high school. And if she likes it now, I'd like her to continue to like it. I'd like her to go with her friends. And if, and if when she gets to be old enough to go to high school, she wants to come to Campo with me, which she probably won't because she doesn't want to be under my thumb. But if she wanted to, that would be great, okay? If she doesn't and she wants to go to Higley and continue to be with her friends, then that's where she'll be, wherever she's going to be the most happy, wherever she is going to enjoy her education. And if she had to move, I think it would rock our family. And I just want you to, to know that. And I appreciate your time. Mr. Kresge, can you pull up the slide again that showed us
the number of kids and the grades that it affects? Thank you. All right, Megan Jones. Hi. I don't know if I can connect with him. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you very much. I appreciate just the opportunity to speak. Um, I know there's a bigger picture here. My kids are not the end all. Um, but just a little backstory. I have five kids that attend Hoagie. Um, I have three that are currently at Centennial. I have one in Fossilman, and I have one in, at Great State of Oregon. Um, one of my Centennial students will be moving to Fossilman next year. We just moved um, those three Centennial kids from a charter school last year. Um, found our house specifically to go to Centennial um, in the hopes that they, they did, that go to Fossilman and they go to Hoagie. Um, with that being said, we are not in a position, um, at basically this, this boundary change will leave us um, to go back to that charter school. Um, we're not in a position to be able to take our students to school. Um, we are part of that Arbor situation that does take the bus. Um, we are, I think, 22 minutes walk according to my maps, for my children that will be entering fourth grade next year, um, to walk to our room. It's 22 minutes in 115 degrees in pouring rain. Um, with that being said, I do really have two questions, and I don't know if we're able to get clarification. Um, my one question would be, are we truly talking about one bus, or are we talking about two buses? There's a big difference in 150,000 or 300. By next school year, um, it will be two buses. For those of you that have students on the bus right now, you know it's extremely full. Um, there's more students assigned to the bus than the bus will hold. Um, however, with students being sick and having clubs, we make it work, but it's running about 81 students. That includes everyone, but if we didn't do the change that most fifth graders would become sixth graders, and we would get new kindergartners that would offset. Um, I think my other, and I don't, this is probably something you would need to answer for me. Um, somebody had mentioned a one mile rule. What is the true, uh, you know, one mile as the crow fly, flies is great, but no kid can walk straight to their house to get to the school. So we are, in essence, the majority of the arbors is way past the one mile mark. Um, so what, what is, it, is it truly one mile straight distance where we would qualify for a bus? Uh, so it's a one mile radius. Um, so if you draw a circle around the school one mile, that's what it would be. Um, arterial streets, um, we block off. So uh, like Germain, you know, Art Higley Road, Power Road would all be arterial streets. Um, Ranch House does not qualify for an arterial street. Um, and currently there are no buses for Power Ranch for mainstream students. So everyone that's going to Power Ranch now currently walks and uses the crossing guards to go past Ranch House. For Power Ranch. Thank you. So we currently have um, several crossing guards for Power Ranch. Actually, I used the mouse on the board members can see it too. Um, there is one down here by the clubhouse. Um, there's one right here at the large T intersection, and then we do have one to the north up here. It's already in place for these students that are going to Power Ranch already. Um, basically, like I said, it, it really are for our family, and uh, again, we're not the end all. There is a much bigger picture here, and I understand that, but our family would be forced back to a charter school. Um, simply because I'm not comfortable with my fourth graders, two fourth graders walking that distance, um, and I'm not in a position to provide transportation. Um, before school is not an option because I leave at four th or 5.30, he leaves at 4.30. It's you know, just not feasible for all families. Um, I just, 
would hope that some consideration, a, a new point that was brought up tonight that I don't know, uh, you know, the, the accelerated program or the bridges program, if the students are being bused to that program and an option to them, that bothers me that our students are not going to be bused, that we don't have the ability to retain that bus to continue to go to Centennial. Um, I, almost to the point where I, I would say, would there be a way to grandfather some of these students? I mean, could we say, okay, we've got kids that are close to the end of their school, could we continue to provide transportation for them and cut it off? The new kindergartners that are entering, could we say the boundaries for the kindergarten students go to Power Ranch and go to Centennial? I, I would just question if there's other options. So, thank you. Prior to coming to the Gateway School District, I served on the Board of Education for Ingleton Community Schools for over 12 years. That was a district that grew by 2 and 3,000 students every year. We did have discussions and roughly 2,000 changes. At no time did we ever, we only moved students when the schools got crowded because we wanted the least disruption to the children's education. So. When the district formed, we had what we called enrollment distribution committees. And these committees were the parents. The parents at each school said, okay, this is the issue at our school, it's overcrowded, let the other schools work together. They came up with a plan and they presented it to the board. This is the parents coming to us saying, okay, we get it, it's overcrowded, things like that. Um, we mentioned uh, even the grandfathers. We, we grandfathered all the time in Ruffton for this because these children, these families have established relationships and it's so important. And on, on these numbers, these numbers are insignificant to be moving children around. I, and, and, and our board members are not asked the question, what's the problem? And nobody gave us an answer. And yet that was the majority of the presentation was from uh, two bus, two people or two bus. But yet the letter that the families got does not mention anything about the finances. And if I'm going to make a decision about investing in something, I need to see what the cost is involved because this is affecting these children at this school. So I just, you know, it's, I don't see the numbers here to justify. Um, we made decisions last year or two ago. We are busing the children all over this district to the screening program at the bridges. So, so why are we not having a conversation and saying, okay, if we need two more buses, maybe we need to take a look. I'm not throwing that out there, but there needs to be a plan here. And, and today, this, this, this is not a plan. There, there wasn't a discussion with these parents. When we did um, moving at the individual schools when they were overcrowded, the administration went to those schools, met with the parent group, listened to their concerns, and came up with a plan. I don't know if anybody even came and talked to you as a group. Did anybody come and talk to you as a group? All you got was this, this, this letter? You know, we have to understand that, that the parents here this evening, I applaud them for coming, but the parents and the children are the biggest advocates for the state of our school system. And it's so important. They are our customers. And we need to include them in the decision-making process. If, if we're going to move forward on these particular things, I'm just, this is, these are just some of my thoughts. I, I don't see the finances here. Nobody has given me some numbers saying, hey, it's $100,000, hey, it's $50,000. I have seen absolutely no numbers. This is just blanket and, and reference to the thought process. So I, I'm not, not very specific to the administration. President Reese? Okay. President Reese, members of the board, um, I would like to make, make a comment is that I truly believe this process is working exactly the way it's supposed to work. We did, this is the first open meeting for parents to come to us and to talk about it. Uh, last time we brought it to the board uh, at a work study, we asked if we could bring it forward. We, we came to the board and said, this is something we're gonna talk about. We will have the proper process that is laid out in the policies. And we did hear from parents tonight. As you will see, we have more parents at our board meeting here tonight to discuss this issue than we have at any of our board meetings in the last year. I think the process is working. We have heard from parents. We have heard some of their concerns. I am taking notes vigorously and listening to their concerns. I do believe there's ways and different things we can look at, but this is the process. 
We had to hear what those issues were. We have to talk to our community. We have to talk to our leaders while still trying to make economical and finance efficiencies within the district. I think the process is working. I am very grateful for all the parents that came tonight. Thank you very much. It gives us some things to think about and things to go back and take a look at. But this is part of the process, and we have to start the conversation somewhere. We did that at the last board meeting to bring it forward. We did. We have a lot of great parent input, and so now we can go back and take a look at some of these other issues. So I do believe the process is working the way it was intended, and I'm very grateful, and I love the process that we have so we can hear from our constituents and make the very best decisions we can while being fiscally responsible. President Reese, um, I just want to thank all the parents, too, that came out and put um, personalities and stories behind students. Sometimes up here, we look at numbers, and um, I love that you all came and gave me that visual, and I got to know some of your students. I can even see some of them in the, class or in the, in the audience. So I just want to say thank you for that. I want to thank um, parents for bringing us uh, attention to how this was presented. Mr. Grandy, thank you. I believe our communication is one of our biggest strategic plans that we are working on and um, just making sure that when we send something out to the community, it is relevant and it is um, precise. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, I too have many concerns over this. Um, I've shared them with Dr. Thomason, um, Kids Crossing. Um, I know there's gonna be students that would want to stay at Centennial and um, Crossing Germain and not going clear over to the tunnel. Um, things like that are very concerning to me, the safety of our children. And I too agree that these numbers are not significant. Um, they're not big enough on paper that I'm seeing that this has got to be done and it's got to be done soon. Um, so again, I, I just kind of echo what's going on in the meeting tonight. And again, thank you to the parents that all came and spoke on the behalf of your students. I very much appreciate to hear those stories. Thank you, Mrs. Taylor. I agree. Thank you for everyone for coming regarding that. Um, I just want to remind everyone, this is the first part of a public hearing. This is not, it's not on a board agenda. It is something that the district is looking at and seeking input to determine if it is something that they will bring before the board. So I just want to clarify that it, this, it's not on our board agenda for approval or um, it's part of our process, like Dr. Thomason said, to have public comment, to have um, communication with um, our constituents and our parents and everyone who lives in that area that it affects. and even those who it doesn't affect are welcome to, to come speak about it. Um, Mr. Crosby, I know, spent time with multiple leaders and principals, and, and there have been conversations at the sites regarding that. Um, so it, it's not just transportation that's just come forward. There have been some further discussions regarding that. So I, too, like Dr. Thomason, took lots and lots of notes and um, we will make sure Mr. Crosby gets this and can address those concerns, answer questions regarding um, specific finances and um, we can also look at other options um, and determine what the best way to move forward is, whether we go forward with presenting the, the boundary change to the board or have different options or grandfathering who knows what that request may be so this is just a proposal for public comment and we certainly appreciate you taking your time this evening um, spending your valentine's evening with us and um and sharing that and making the the information relevant to your family so thank you does anyone else before we close our pub, go ahead. Anyone? Hi, I'm Tomi. Um, my child does attend Centennial. I am a single mom, working mom of six kids, who are, three of which are foster kids. Um, so it would be a huge impact for my family just trying to, just trying to navigate and juggle. I have kids at all levels of education right now. So timing is 
important for us. Um, I would just suggest maybe perhaps, like a lot of the parents that I talked to had no idea that this was even being brought to you all. Um, and I don't know if that could be shared in the classrooms with their teachers to send home information so that parents would be more aware that this is something that their children may, may or may not have to go through. Um, I love the idea of having the grandfathered in situation. We just moved here uh, a year ago, so for my son to have to change again would be, and just trying to you know provide stability for these kids. So I just appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thank you. And Tony, my apologies. Your paper got, it was stuck with another one. So I apologize. I did not intentionally leave you out. Thank you for coming forward. Make sure I don't have any other stuck together. Does anyone else? Comments or discussion? Mr. Glover? It is working. User error. Sorry. Um, thank you, Madam President, and, and uh, everybody. I think I think what's different here in the past. I hope um, is that what I think I hear you saying, Dr. Thomason, is that this is is not a done deal. And I think maybe in the past um, decisions were made, and they were sort of uh, maybe crammed down people's throats. And I hope that I, I mean I again reiterate what you said. I thank everybody for participating in the process. Too many people don't. Um, this is how democracy should work, and it, it is Valentine's Day. We acknowledge that. <laughs> um, but uh, again, you know, the superintendency brought this to us, and I would not make, I'm just telling the people out in the audience, I wouldn't make a decision like this without, without good feedback, solid data, and being utterly convinced that this is a sound plan that has been well communicated and involved our stakeholders. That is what we are committed to, and so I'm, I'm listening intently, and I'm hearing what you're saying. I share all the same concerns and probably a few more, um, I think any plan like this should have a component of long-term stability. Changing boundaries is painful, and it's not something that should be done on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, we should be thinking 10 years, and, and actually we should start to be thinking a little bit about you know, the days in about 10 years when Higley stops growing. Um, and so those sort of things should all factor into, into, those, um, into a decision like this. But I also, what I also heard, and I just want to um, call out to... Um, Ms. Broadley, is what I'm hearing is, I just want to compliment you on the type of school and community um, that I'm hearing that your staff has built for these families. So um, I didn't, I didn't miss that point. So it's nice to hear. Anything else before we close the public hearing? All right, thank you. We will now close the public hearing and resume our meeting. We will go on to our consent agenda items. I move that we approve the consent agenda items as presented. Second. Any questions or comments regarding consent? Mr. Glover? Always. Uh, where are we go? We're all the way through 4.10 as well? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me just. I want to pull up the right document. I just had a question. Uh, 4.1. Oh, okay. So, uh, Dr. Thomason, uh, 4.10 is staff involvement in decision making, and it, it, it says we've added such as meet and confer process, but then we have you struck the, the very last line. And I thought that was a I thought it was a nice line. Is it? Are we? Why did you cross that out? I guess the part that says the superintendent shall weigh with care the counsel given by the employees and inform the board. Are you, is that? Is that because it's implied in meet and confer? I just don't know why it needed to be taken out, I guess.
Councilman Reese, uh, Mr. Glover, we're talking about um, the, the new policy for GDD and uh, the part that says the superintendent shall establish with certified and support staff employees channels such as the meet and confer process for ready uh, in commu intercommunication of ideas and feelings regarding the operation of the schools. Uh, the, and I think that the part that was struck out, which is the superintendent shall weigh with care and counsel given by employees and inform the board of such counsel and the processing. I think that is part of the meet and confer process and that's something we're already doing, so I believe that's already stated. But I would defer to, um, to our staff attorney, um, Mrs. Good, on that aspect. It's um, board um, agenda item GBB. Right, actually, um, Mrs. Martins and I put our heads together and said, what was that? And um, it is that we just felt it was repetitive when we added in the um, meet and confer process. Okay, I mean, I, I, I trust under your superintendency, I just worry maybe as another superintendent down the road. Not, uh, <laughs> don't read anything, it's, but <laughs> might need that spelled out, but uh, it's okay, I mean, you know, I guess that, that's fine, thanks. Any other questions on the consent agenda? Uh, Madam President, just one more in uh, 4.11. Better pull that up. Must be open. Uh, this is about gifts and solicitations by staff members, um, and it's it's about some of those GoFundMe's and things. And uh, basically, I, what this is saying is that the just check with the principal first. Totally fine. I get it. We should do that. Um, as somebody who works in technology, um, I do know that sometimes teachers will see, you know, like a like a sixty dollar laptop, and they'll think, "Oh, I should get as many of these as I can," and then they really aren't compatible with um, some of the systems that we have here in place. And cheaper is not always better, and it's an element of durability. So, it doesn't need to be added to the policy. But I just would ask uh, the cabinet and the superintendency to just maybe make sure. If someone's going to put a specific item up for GoFundMe's, that maybe Higley consider which type of items they should be. Maybe minimum specs for, uh, you know, if if you know we don't support iPads, I know we do, but if if we didn't or did or whatever, that there was maybe something that teachers could look to first before they went to a GoFundMe and ended up buying the wrong thing, and then there's all sort of hurt feelings. It doesn't need to be policy, but do we? Uh, President Ruiz, uh, Mr. Glover. Um, we hear what you're saying, and that has been an issue in the past. And so, for any technology items that come through, it does have to have um, the site administrator approval. Also, with technology items, it needs to go through our IT department with Mr. Chuck Kelly or Mr. Robert Shrope, because we know that some items may be um, donated to the district, but the cost of implementation for those items may uh, exceed the actual value and support that we're able to give those items, especially when it comes to technology. Okay, but so for a GoFundMe, though, a teacher really could do that on their own, but we're saying now they should check with their principal who then also would, before they put up a GoFundMe. Even with our, with our GoFundMe sites, we've talked about this in Cabinet, it still has to have administrative approval. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Mr. Glover, we talked about the donors choose, and that, that way the site administrators know what, what's coming. Any other questions or comments about consent? Great, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries by zero. All right, we are now going to go into our work study presentations and we will be starting with a media center update. President Reese, members of the board, at this time I would like to invite up to the podium uh, Valerie Thomas to start out our media um, specialists and our media center updates. Valerie. President Reese, members of the board, my name is Valerie Thomas. I'm the instructional technology coach and a teacher on assignment. <laughs> and I work with teachers and support teachers, and I work with our media specialists, who um, some of them are here with us tonight. And we put together this presentation, and we spent several hours doing so, and they wanted to be here to 
tell you about their program and how it's progressed this year themselves. So I'm going to introduce them to you and then let them take over. We have Darla Hargis from Higley Traditional Academy. Cynthia McKeon, who is uh, from Cortina, she's not here tonight. We have Scott Bells, Power Ranch, he is not here tonight. Megan Musto from Bridges. Angie Walker, Centennial. <laughs> Jen Ford from Santan Elementary. Christy Arnett, Chaparral Elementary, and she is Chaparral's 2018 Teacher of the Year, and she's sitting in the audience. She's the one on the um, right. <laughs> uh, Julie Mathers from Coronado Elementary, she's sitting in the audience as well. And Trisha Wright, Gateway Point Elementary, and she is also uh, Gateway's 2018 Teacher of the Year. And before I hand it over to them, um, I wanted to read a couple of quotes that I have for you. First one coming from Karen Bacon, principal at the Higley Traditional Academy. She says, the technology work that Darla is doing with students is impressive. Even the little ones are learning to navigate the trackpad, scroll, and log into their accounts with ease. We have another uh, quote from a parent, Katie Boucher. This morning, my boys were singing your praises. Finn and Benjamin were raving about how much fun technology is. They love making a Word document. They are enjoying this new class so much. I keep looking over there because I know whose parent that is. <laughs> and then um, from Miss Mustos, I was talking on the phone with her the other day, and she said, students as young as first grade and second grade are getting logged onto the computers by themselves. And that's a huge feat. <laughs> and using the internet and Microsoft programs. Teachers are so happy with how much faster our younger students are logging into the computers for testing and daily use. So, I'm going to hand it over to the ladies. Before we get started, I'd just like yes, to make just a few comments. I'd like to thank each and every one of you, you know, from the media specialists in our schools. It's an ever-changing every day. Um, I'm employed at the college level, so I see the skills that are necessary for our students to come into the college to in order to have these things. And like I said, it's changing every day. The, the workforce today that, that the college students are going into is, um, I was looking at one that we show our students, it's called Unilever. If you ever wanted to look it up, you can look up Unilever. It's one of the um, Fortune 500 companies. And when you watch their avatar talk to you about how to get a job with them, it's not, I'm not here to talk about the job, I'm here to talk about the technology. It's the skills, it's all these things that they have to have if they want to even work in this company. And they talk about artificial intelligence is here, it's coming, okay? It's, it's here right now, it's here in the job market, and so these students, when they're going from college into the job market, they have to be aware of the artificial intelligence and decision-making pace uh, places because as I talk to the students that go on and that are working at Unilever around the country right now, what they talk about is their coworkers aren't from Chicago or next door. Their coworkers are from around the world. And because these corporations are looking for the best and brightest in the world. So our students, thank to you, need these skills to be competitive because we're talking, your students are global citizens. And the skills that you're bringing forward are skills that they need to be global citizens. Thank you for what you do, and I know it's changing every day. It's great to see you. Well, thank you. Um, so one of the first things we just wanted to talk about was the Battle of the Books. Um, each of our different schools hosts a Battle of the Books. I know at Bridges we had 20 teams, which is approximately 60 students. Um, Battle of the Books is great because it gets the kids really excited about reading and competing against each other, and it encourages them to read books that they might not usually read, and they end up loving them. Schools are, have Battle of the Books. All of them. And how are our numbers look this year? How did the numbers for the teams? 
Um, we had 20. I think they range anywhere from maybe seven to all the way up to 20. And I think all of us can say that in years prior, we have grown the number of students. So we're all very proud to say that we're probably at the highest we have been in years. So, so each one of the media specialists are oversee the That's program. correct. Each one of the media specialists. And then just one more quote, a quote. <laughs> Technology class has been an excellent challenge for all of our students, especially the HPAL students. They love applying standards that they are learning in class when making PowerPoints, brochures, and other various projects. These are pictures of second and third grade students that are practicing their typing skills, which um, we use as a stepping stone to get to higher, lo higher level skills. Um, we wanna make sure that the students are equipped with the skills that they need to be successful in the real world, and especially during benchmark testing as well, so that they know how to navigate the computer they know how to type, where to find things, so that when we are testing, we can measure. It's a true testament of what they know and not having them try to manipulate and find things on the computer, but a true testament to where they are. And then on the bottom right, there's a little, a little kid, and he's um, learning to copy and paste and then um, wrap text features around, around the graphics. So um, I love our thing, not your grandma's librarian. <laughs> Obviously, the media specialist position itself has changed so much over the years, as you well know. <clears throat> um, today, we are more of a, we still empower students, but now it's more of a critical thinker. It's a global type thing. Um, enthusiastic readers, of course, but they also are skillful researchers. Um, and a big part of what we do is the ethical use of the information that we're providing to them. The uh, saying nowadays, it's called the unquiet library. <laughs> so it's to be the hub of, so that's the new word, not the grandmother's. Okay. It's Thank the, you. <laughs> the unquiet library on that one. There so, you go. Okay. It is definitely that. <laughs> Uh, we're going to speak a little bit now about the curriculum and how we came up with the map. Um, this process started last spring in 2017, and all of us were a part of it, as well as Valerie Thomas, of course. We looked at the ISTE standards, as well as other school district and states nationwide, to create what we thought was going to support our students and build a continuum that will grow with the skill set as well as changes in the technology. So this year we are obviously implementing new things that we have never done before and we constantly hope to grow with that and get the students up to speed and where they need to be. On the um, standards for the third that we're looking at right now, um, how are we training in this? I mean, who is our person who is training you on these standards in reference to this curriculum? And that's, that's my question. And what training has this individual, do they have people certified in this, this particular curriculum to go through these standards? That's all, it's just, I'm looking at a lot of different things here. So who, as you are at your individual schools, who is coming to you with the expertise and the training from SD? Each month, we hold a PLC, a media specialist PLC, and I, we go through a training. I have brought people in um, from Smart Notebook, from Microsoft Office, or it is myself giving a training. So do any of our, any of the people here have digital badges in reference to this? Okay. Digital badging? So Not yet. You know, understand what I'm oh, asking yeah, you? Yeah, but not yet, but we are working on it. We also have um, a lot of online courses that we are looking at taking. We have um, been to Gilbert um, to do the wonderful summer program that, that Scott puts, that Mr. Glover puts on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and so that helps a lot. Um, 
We have a couple people who have been to, she keeps calling it ISTE. <laughs> I don't know if, if, if you're the only one, you and I, if anybody else understands what digital badging is. Yes. I don't know if you want to share that with them. Or Actually, where we I, yeah. Oh. So it is, well, I, you know, you explain it so much better sure, than I, and I'm much more nervous. Sure, it's, it's the future in reference to how, and it's kind of not trying to simplify, it's like, you know, the Girl Scout badges, okay? But it's the, um, it's the digital age now, like when you have your LinkedIn account, there's different things, skills that you list at the bottom of your LinkedIn account, and there, those are badges there. So in reference to the, the technology world, um, that's what they're using now that you take so many classes and you're trained in these particular fields that that's where we go. That's, that's what the future is in reference to uh, digital badging. And um, it's important, we have um, some programs that are coming across um, educational technology programs over here at ASU that are teaching us in reference to that. So it's, it's important to, if you know what you're doing with this, but we need some validation that we know you know what you're doing with this in reference to this. And Office 365 um, offers that as well for us, so that sure, there are sure. many different programs and things that we can learn from and get the badges from there and then accrue. Sure. So I, I guess with the curriculum, again, the training, I saw notebook and things like that, but is there, I, I'm not catching where, where the training's going, so each one of you are expertise and we're all on the same page in reference to the curriculum. I think, it's, somebody. I think it's a work in progress, and we realize that, and we love your feedback on that. Um, and it is, we sit down and we talk about what is up here, and that is something that is our going forward, because we're going to look at what did we not hit well, what did we do really well on, how can we learn from each other. Sure. There are some ladies here that are phenomenal at certain things that I'm you know, I can help them with, and they can help me with other things. So a lot of it is learning from each other, kind of like teachers do. Yeah, <laughs> but, but uniformity is very important to guarantee that all the I children agree. in Higley are getting these things. And, and I don't believe in on-the-job training. Um, I have a two-year-old granddaughter now with her, with her parents' home goes through like this. So <laughs> logging on to the computer is not even at least two-year-olds. So and, and Microsoft Word. These children are way past that, so it's. I, I guess it's just we to to look at the curriculum. We need somebody here to with the expertise that's making guaranteeing that these things are in place. I mean, um, I shared with the board members and I think the superintendent that global the study of across the country what schools are doing across the country. It's a 60-page um, report. I don't know if you looked at it, but. But the, one of the things they talk about to have a successful media specialist program is certain things need to be implemented at each year. And the first year, one of them was Makerspace. And if we're going to have a successful program, we need to have a plan with this. And it's not on-the-job training. It's not those particular things because our children deserve things now because, like I said, they're coming to college and they're expected to know that. So they cannot back up on-the-job training. It does not do our children supplies stuff. So if we're not doing even something as simple as one of the three things that they're telling us to have successful media centers as compared across the country, so, I mean, the bare minimum was makerspace, and I don't know how many of us have makerspace or don't have makerspace, so there's some just some basic things here that, that need to be in place for us to be successful, and, and I guess the other decision is who's making the decision that that we don't have makerspace at two or three of our schools and the other schools do. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, we need to have a plan. A plan needs to be in place with this particular program. Just. Uh, Mr. Watovich, I just want to continue on the presentation and hear what they are doing. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I understand some of your concerns, but I think this isn't the forum at this very second to be um, This is a work hitting. study session. I understand, but they don't need to hear some of the things that you're saying at this moment. Those are conversations that I think we need to have, well, and we need to be having them with um, sure. at other times. That's I right. would love to hear all the great things that they are doing. Sure. That this is a brand new um, media specialist or brand new to Higley, and I'm excited for all the things that you have accomplished 
I've been in some of your um, libraries and your technology centers, and um, I know that we need to do more. Uh, that's obvious, and and I do agree, Mr. Wojtowicz, that we need to have some, um, what's the word that you use, some uh, same things at the same schools. Right. And, um, but again, I'd love to hear more from you. Sure. I just want to make note on one of those um, bolded items, the knows the correct spacing after word sentences and paragraphs. I get yelled at by my kids because I double space. <laughs> my kids tell me that is no longer appropriate. They're like, mom, why are you double spacing? So apparently they're learning that and so I still double space. <laughs> so one of the pieces of curriculum that we just recently adopted is learning.com. Um, learning.com is a wonderful tool that teaches um, and assists us with teaching many of the technology standards. Um, it does a great job with digital citizenship, internet safety, and like I said, all of the technology standards. Um, it's really neat because the students really, there's a lot of options with it, but the students really apply the standards. They have to create safe passwords and put what would be appropriate in an online discussion board and all of those 21st century skills that our children are going to be doing online. So we'd like to show you guys just an example. So this is a third grade lesson about cyberbullying. Um, we'll just kind of look through it. And other electronic devices. Select where you might find cyberbullying. People can computer basics. Cyberbullying. People can act mean at school, on the playground, on a bus, or in your neighborhood. Being mean again and again is called bullying. People can also act mean in cyberspace, the space where people communicate online. Being mean in cyberspace is called cyberbullying. Cyberbullying can happen on computers, cell phones, gaming systems, and other electronic devices. Select where you might find cyberbullying. So this is an example of something that we can do on learning.com called plug and play, um, where the students can log on and there are some videos that walk them through teaching them the standards and they have to actually do them and apply them. Um, but learning.com has lots of different options. Um, another one is inquiry. Well, here's, here's some other ones and then, yeah, inquiry. Um, inquiry lessons are questions that are project-based and they include the grade level standards as well. Um, these are going to be like a mini lesson that a teacher would do about a technology standard with a technology component in the lesson. And like I said, they're very inquiry-based and project-based. So we're very excited to have learning.com because it has a lot of opportunities for our students. Oh yes, and it does include coding, which is you know something big that we're all working on and the kids absolutely love. So it does have the coding component as well. And yeah, and we've received some professional development on it and there are options on the website as well. One of our ITSE standards is the Empowered Learner. Um, at this point, the students learn the different parts of the computer. They learn technology vocabulary so that they can be fluid when they are communicating with peers. Um, one activity to um, practice their researching skills were students engaged in an online scavenger hunt where they learned and practiced the tools necessary to be um, safe digital citizens within, we call it a digital neighborhood, and they were able to practice their problem solving skills, and then, um, as we talked about before, keyboarding skills as well.
And to speak a little bit more on the digital citizenship, because this is something we spend quite a bit of time on first quarter, um, it was really important for us to let the students know that the expectation when they are lying online is to be making safe choices. So we all taught lessons on how to protect passwords, how to be safe, how to use this THINK acronym that's up here on the screen, which is teaching students in utilizing social media, even email, how to be true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind. And it's something we constantly revisit on probably a daily basis with them in uh, this digital world and the access the students have to just about everything online. Um, we continue, obviously, revisiting this throughout, but we spent a great deal kind of setting the stage and the expectations with the new technology curriculum and implementation in the Media Center. Uh, an example of what we did for K2 was the digital neighborhood example that Angie just spoke on, and we related it back to these little students and how they feel safe in their community, in their home neighborhood. And so we wanted to make sure that they understood stranger danger and how people online seem that they're really nice, but they might not be, and how to look for certain things that might show them that, you know, making good choices and making sure that they were always staying safe. Knowledge um, even prior to the new Office 365, um, our K-6 students have been working on the very basics, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, things like that, which, you know, they're so excited to go home. A little girl came to me and today and said, I had to show my mom how to do a PowerPoint correctly so that it would loop. So um, they're working on that. And now with the 365, we're able to provide those families with the resources that they need um, so that they can download. And those students are going to become our world learners. And they are using digital tools. Destiny. Destiny is our library program. It's a management tool that we use for both our textbooks and our library books. Um, it's also a safe space. That's what we call it. It's the websites that we tell the students, if you go to Destiny and you click on this website, someone has checked it to make sure that it is a good website, that you are not going somewhere that is not safe. So. Um, the students have used it for research. Those links are on there. They're able to look at that. Uh, the new HMH curriculum, the first graders study the farm and farm animals. They were able to click on links, look at library books, write down their research, and everything is done right then. This is a student work sample of a third grader um, who was practicing their skills in Microsoft Excel. And what they did is they designed a formula to unveil a mystery picture. And so they created the document, printed it out, and then they gave them to their peers to, to solve. And this student made his little smiley face emoji using the formulas that he had learned in class. Um, computational thinker. So coding and robotics are my passion. Um, to see those second graders pick up coding on the computer is just amazing. Um, they show an interest in programming. They say, oh wow, that's actually a job somebody gets to do. How cool is that? Um, the media specialists take and they can use the coding individually. They can also take and use some of the coding programs, whole group, on the smart boards. Um, then the coding has led such an interest to the robotics that within our district, almost every school is participating now. 
in the East Valley VEX Robotics, and the competition went well. I saw some of you there. Thank you for that. And um, we have that going all the way through high school. So we're starting them young, sending them up. Prodigy, Prodigy Math is an amazing tool to use in the classroom to help supplement um, what is going on in the content level with the monk grades. Um, my kids just beg to do this. And so the program is aligned with Arizona State standards in math. And I'm able to go in there. I'm able to click on the standards that I would like the students to um, practice and to continue to master. And then they can go into the program. They create their own avatar. There's different worlds, and they can actually compete against each other solving math problems. And they just absolutely love it. It's also a good um, progress monitoring checkpoint as well to see the skills that um, they're proficient on and where they need to continue to work on as well. In addition to that, um, students have engaged in um, STEM-based webinars through Makisa, and what they do is they offer STEM-based um, webinars, like I had said, from professionals in their field, and just recently the students heard from the scientists at Odyssey um, Aquarium in Scottsdale, and they were able to learn from the scientist at the aquarium. And then I was able to go in and type up the questions that they had. It sends it straight to the scientist, and they're able to come back directly and answer the students' questions that they had. And in addition to that, we also use Smart Notebook. Um, there's a lot of brand new future, or features to Smart Notebook. Um, it's just a great collaboration tool with both teachers and peers and gets everybody engaged at the same time. The kids love it. Other duties that we are doing on a daily basis is inputting books into our system, Destiny, that uh, Darla was talking about. Weeding out books and making sure we have up-to-date text for the students, things that they're interested in, things that they want to read and want to see on their shelves in the library. Um, we coordinate asset transfers amongst campuses, disperse the curriculum, and gather teacher resources. Um, some of the extracurricular things that we're also involved in, um, one of the big ones is the book fair. Each of us hosts a book or two book fairs um, at our schools, and the book fairs are just a great way to encourage a love of reading, and they support the students and teachers school-wide. We spoke about Battle of the Books, but we also um, invite authors to come and visit, which engage the students in not only reading, but more recently, um, an author presented how she became an author and the writing style. Um, robotics, as uh, Darla spoke about, spelling and geography bee, intervention planning team coordinator, some of us are, and student council advisor. So we all hold different roles on our campus as well as media specialists. I wanted to ask a question about that intervention specialist. So I, I was reading that and I was thinking, you all do that? But it sounds like you don't. Cause I think at every campus, um, some of us have an expertise in something specific to what that campus might need. So it varies. Well, I, I also want to put in a, a little plug here. So I know I, I did see you at a really long all day, very nice all day Saturday event. And I know that the Battle of the, uh, Battle of the Books, are you guys doing that during the day? So you're giving up your extra time for, oh wait, okay. So I'm thinking stipends here for some of these things, and I don't know if you're getting one for robotics. I think Battle of the Books would be an appropriate expenditure, because it is, you're giving up your prep time, right? Am I, I mean, and lunches and things like that. Um, and so I don't know if all of those include stipends or not, but perhaps perhaps that's something you could talk about with your leadership, um, because we, we ask a great deal of you, and I know that you give it uh, freely, but uh, anyway, so I, I'll stop there.
there's actually a picture missing, and I don't know why, right there, it's where it's blank, and it's a picture of Jen Ford standing in front of all the HMH boxes that they had to unload <laughs> for all the curriculum. I'm not sure why it's missing, but it's there. Now we're just gonna show you a few pictures that we have. So this is Book Fair that, like Megan said, we host twice a year. And there is a picture of an author's visit. a continuation there. Um, this was a event that we hosted in connection with a literacy event on our campus. So we constantly try to, you know, engage in other events as well, not just, you know, isolate ourselves as the media specialist, but whenever we can integrate, you know, the STEM and, the, you know, math things, spelling bee, we try to obviously um, work that into the media center and the pumpkins were based on books that the kids had made and displayed. So just a, just a quick year in review. Uh, each ladies, or each of the ladies plus Scott, we can't forget Scott. <laughs> they do take on leadership opportunities uh, at their schools. And some of those are uh, training on the Microsoft Office 365. They have taken on that training at their school as the trainer of trainers. Um, some of them are on-site gradebook experts, along with all those other duties that we just talked about. <laughs> um, and some of them mentor new teachers. Professional development is part of the year in review. And our professional development, like I said earlier, we were getting there, <laughs> um, is we meet once a month in, in our PLC, and we do provide professional development each time uh, during those uh, meetings that we have. Some of the professional development that we offer is the, the new smart board features. That's a collaborative piece where the students are on their own devices, and they can throw up their answers and interact with the, the teacher, which is up there in front of the classroom. That's a really cool feature. Um, Microsoft Office just came available and we are rolling it out as we speak to the schools. We've got um, several schools that have already got the very first training, so they're super excited. Teachers are like, ooh, and awing during the trainings. <laughs> um, and of course, the Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, because they do support the teachers in the classroom with um, those reading skills. Uh, gradebook trainings, learning.com, and I'm, I couldn't put all of them up there, but because we'd be here all night. <laughs> Um, but as far as the curriculum adoption, I'm going to let um, Angie talk about that and how they support the teachers. Yeah, like Valerie said, we have loved supporting the new HMH adoption and supplementing what the classroom teachers are doing as well. And so um, we've exposed the children to the Channel One News. I know we um, meet monthly with the classroom teachers to try to enrich the themes um, and expand on what they're working on in the classroom. Um, I know just at the, the lower level, first and, so, uh, first and second grade, if they're working on phonics, trying to find different programs and activities that incorporate technology skills that are enforcing what the teacher is teaching in the classroom. We um, proctor the weekly skills tests and integrate 21st century technology skills within the HMH phone. Available and super successful. The teachers have loved it. They for um, really supporting them and for Can I interject a question? It's, I think it's a good time to interject. So uh, I know that um, you guys were asked to assign grades, and I was quite aghast at that because it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids. And it was my thought that as you're, as you're enriching something that is being done in a classroom, like teaching them, I don't know, you know, like how to make slides, digital slides, whatever, um, that the teacher, the regular classroom teacher could then pr provide a grade for that skill and then you wouldn't have to. So I, I could be totally wrong, but it seems like entering grades for 800 kids is a lot to ask. And I'm not, what are, could, could you talk about that maybe? Is it, it's a lot. I just want to know if it's too much or we can ease things up a little bit or what your thoughts were on that, please. Well, I think 
there's many aspects to it and it's complicated, but I think at the same token, it's nice to have um, accountability in what we do and it gives it validity and importance. And I think that the students appreciate that and respect that. And so, I, like I said, I feel like there's different layers to it, but I think it is necessary in order to have to have the validity and for the students to respect the, the program and the continuum that we're trying to, to enforce for them. So looking forward, our goal is to encourage innovation with more hands-on technology enhanced learning. Uh, we want to focus on coding literacy to transform students into computational thinkers, which um, students inventing and collaborating, collaborate, <laughs> collaborating regularly as they work through complex problems to gain those concrete skills. Um, boosting digital literacy amongst our uh, Higley students is important and ensures that children develop creative thinking skills and problem solving skills. We also want to integrate additional learning technologies into the core curriculum. Continue our professional development. Rolling out Microsoft 365 to the, to the staff and students. We're, we're not done this year. We still have a whole second year left. Um, and we want to support the new math curriculum adoption that's coming up, just, uh, just, as, just like we're doing with the ELA. We want to be there for the math. Reviewing, and I think we said this earlier in the presentation, but we're constantly reviewing and revising the technology standards because it's always ongoing and technology is always changing. And then um, working towards the media specialist endorsements. Uh, we have a few that are working towards that this year. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Um, I know I have a few questions. Um, when the ISTE, is that correct? ISTE? ISTE? ISTE. I'm sorry, it's Itsy Bitsy Spider for me. <laughs> Just is. Um, for, this, for the state standards, the one you showed us, that is going off of their recommendations as well as incorporating the Arizona State Standards that we have for technology that you guys have collectively worked on to create, like, here's our state standard, here's the industry standard, this is third grade, this is what we want to see out of it. So, um, and I heard Mr. Wachovich's question. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm thinking because you you're creating it together, you're kind of holding each other accountable and have the same expectation. Uh, am I, let me know if I'm, that's how it came across to me, so I just wanted to clarify that, okay, this is what we're talking about, this is what we're doing, this is how we're doing that. If yes, it, when we meet, th that is exactly what we do, is we talk and we uh, discuss those standards and if they need to be revised, that's what we look at. Uh, it's not just me, it's not admin, saying this is what we need to do. It's, it's this group right here, well, and the others that aren't here, but it's all of us. Okay, and I'm looking at your, your going forward, and I see goals and everything. Um, I think I'm gonna use a word from Mr. Wachovich earlier. What's the plan? I, I, I get you would like to, you know, boost the digital literacy among HUSD students. How, what does that look like? What, what are we doing? When we talked about the media specialist, um, and I know you have a lot on your plate, so, and it's a work in progress, like you said, and when we implemented the media specialist for this year and we wanted to go more technology, my, interpretation of that is this year we need to get our feet wet we need to get our kids in computer labs we need to we need to start this but it's an infant and next year we're going to be one year and then we're going to be two years 
and the growth in between where we are today, um, and we only have three months of school left. So where we are today, what are we implementing? How are we implementing? What, how is that going to happen? What, what kind of plan do we have? I, for me, I wanna know, you know, what is boosting our literacy, our digital literacy? What is that? How is that gonna happen? This board has to determine too, um, we ask a lot of you, and I don't think any one of us deny that, and you guys do an amazing job. Technology is huge, and while I don't get it, but it's big, and um, our kids need to learn it, and we need to continue to grow this program. Um, and Mrs. Walker, thank you for that comment on, you know, that you feel the grades provide validity to what you're doing, and, and I think that helps you see they're getting it, you know, and, but how are we gonna help support you, and how can we help move this forward um, if we don't have a plan, if we don't know, do we know what we're implementing next year? Do we know how we're implementing it? Does this board need to figure out how we fund different things? Technology is expensive. So where are we going with that? I'm so glad you asked because we are currently working on a plan. It is not complete, but we are currently working on a plan and I believe it's going to be um, given to you or, or submitted or whatever, however it's given to you, <laughs> presented to you um, in, what is the date? Eight. I think it's April, somewhere like that, yeah. So we are currently working on it. So kind of a comprehensive, this is what we're doing this year, this is, because I'll just be honest with you, my expectation is we add stuff each year because we're just this little, yes. and Mr. Watovich had, you know, brought up that we've got to compete globally, and this is their world. I mean, it, it just is, and so clearly what we're learning today is not going to be enough for tomorrow, and it's not going to be enough for the next year, and so um, that's my concern is we, I think we all want to support you and we want to help you and um, having that plan and the thought for the future, does that mean we end up with I'm not making proposals, <laughs> you know, two media specialists on campuses or I, I mean, where does that go? I did not, <laughs> you know, where, where does that go? How do we, you know, how do we help? So, um, if we have a plan coming and you're working on that with kind of building blocks, you know, this is our foundation, this is where we're starting, and this is how, how we can build up and get bigger and better, and bigger doesn't always mean, doesn't always mean bigger, but bigger things and, and more technology, so. I just want to piggyback on that. You're doing a great job. If I could give you whatever I could give you to be successful, I want that, okay? And, and I guess what my expectation is, I want to be here. I see things around the country, and I see things, and I, and I want that for every child here in the Hickory School District. So, so I support you 110%, and if we can figure out whatever we can do to, to bring in extra people or bring in extra training, whatever we need, you know, makerspace money, just, you know, perhaps we need to make a wish list to, to, to let us know what, what we need to do to, to have these at all the different schools, have makerspace, have all these things that are necessary. But I, like you know, Mr. Glover said, I don't know how you're doing all these things you do. And, um, you know, and- They're superheroes. I don't, <laughs> don't, don't want to wear you out. For okay? our students. <laughs> I know, I know, you guys, you guys are wonderful, but we, we gotta work together here. And I think it's important for us as board members to, to read up on what's happening around the country, to, to read up on studies, because if we're gonna work together here, it's, it's important to, to know what's happening out there and, and see what's happening. So that's, I, I'll just leave it at that. Thank President you. Reese, members of the board, I'd like to also state too that we really 
appreciate everything that our media center specialists are doing. And in uh, Governor Ducey's uh, budget for the 1.06 um, stipend for the teachers, we wanted to make sure that we respected our media specialists. And even though the funds weren't included to pay media specialists by the state, we felt that their jobs and their importance was so high within our district that we chose, the board chose to do that. And I want to thank the board for that. And these guys that are putting together everything they're doing in the media centers and following the Arizona state uh, standards along with the ISTE standards, I think it is, is incredible. ISTE is, as we know, is the leader and we will continue to send people to, to the ISTE conference every year to make sure that we're following the ISTE standards and that we're improving every single year because it is where, where technology is going. And unfortunately for these ladies, the ISTE standards can change year after year after year as technology evolves and grows. And so implementation of the ISTE standards is a much higher level than just the state standards too. And so we appreciate them willing to step into a role and position knowing that their job is going to change on a regular basis. President Reeves. Mrs. Um, Taylor. I too just want to um, you know, thank you again. Um, two things that I wrote down just as you were speaking is what, what can we do for you as a board? So I guess that's kind of the question all of us have is how we can con continue to support you um, with the training, with whatever it is. We just need to hear from you um, on that. I had another thought. Or yes, oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, well, as as Miss Hargis knows, we have our across the across the way there in Gilbert, uh, May 30th and 31st, our our summer ed tech institute, and you can talk to uh, Miss Richards. You all are invited. I suspect Miss Walker, you're probably busy. That's <laughs> That's understandable, but uh, but it is a it is a nice event and, and should give you plenty of ideas and you are more than welcome. I hope I'm not, but there's there's space and we would love to have you there and and your input and if you want to teach, I can arrange for that too if you want to share. Mm. Mr. Glover, members of the board, I think we'll have some volunteers to teach some classes in, in your program this year um, with our coaches and our media specialists. And I guess just a final note. Um, I'd just like to kind of hear from you guys on, it was a fast implementation, there's no doubt about it. There, a lot of back and forth and, and everything. How do you feel so far this year's going and getting out of even the financial piece, because financial, you know, finances take planning, but is there different ways that we can help support you? What could we do better for you, for you guys? And even I'll just add, you know, think about your schedule too. I mean, is it is it working for you? Uh, you know, all these things. Anything? Any thoughts? And truly, I mean, we we want your honest feedback. If if something's not working for you, tell us. And it's not that we're going to step in and fix it, but we <laughs> need to have this conversation so that we can can figure it out. So I think there's been some mixed messages, and I just want to hear from you guys, safe place, we're good, um, how you like feel it's going. For me personally, I could not be more thankful for the technology department and admin working with me because it is new, so things come up and it's like, oh, I need that. I didn't know I needed that. And then talking to administration and talking to Mrs. Broadley and be like, oh, it would be really cool if this came about. And then talking to IT and they're like, oh yeah, and Mr. Schroep being able to add things to our classrooms. And I think just the flexibility aspect as we navigate this, sometimes we don't know what we need until we need it. And so being open to that and just having open communication has been just paramount to my success in, in the media center. Kind of the same thing. I was sitting there thinking I was a media specialist for years and then I went back to the classroom when that position got cut. So when it came back, I really had to think about it and then um, it kind of came after we accepted the jobs, <laughs> really, that, oh, and by the way, you'll be doing technology. Um, but it's been wonderful. It's been the greatest thing I've ever done. And so I thank you for that. 
I thank you for trusting us enough to do what we need to do. Um, we are all professionals, but not professional in this quite yet, and you're going to help us with that. <laughs> Um, but we do. I think we all just love it. We're amazed by it. We're worn out, but we're very happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I would say the same thing. It's I've been in the classroom for all of the years up until this year, and it's definitely been a learning curve. Um, but I do feel supported with all of the technology. Valerie's great at supporting us, and like Angie said, the IT department and everything. So... I've been enjoying it so far. So, in reference to how do you feel like professional development? How many are, of you are going to go to ESPE this year or state conferences? I mean, do you have a plan in reference to, to network here, not only state, but also with ESPE as well? Or do you, have you had that discussion yet? We have hope. <laughs> we would all like to. You know, we have talked about that. Valerie talked about what an amazing experience it was and how, you know, we felt like that would be something that would really help Somebody all of us. The mic. Thank you. Yeah. So that is something that we can discuss with our Title II dollars because you went, right, last year and Julie went. And so I think it was a really great experience. So that's something that we're discussing actually next week. So it's a secret. <laughs> Name names. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you for spending your thank evening you. with us and with us. All right, we're going to go on to 5.2, bring your own technology, bring your own device. President Reese, members of the board, at this time I would like to welcome up Dr. Randy Mellerwine and Nancy Diab to talk to us about the BYOT program at Higby High School and how um, the test period went over, over this year on, um, on, on the BYOT at Higby. Pre President Reese, members of the board, um, as you guys know, we've been kind of piloting a little bit of a different system at Higley High this year. We are, Ms. Dia approached uh, cabinet last year. Uh, we sat down with IT and we created a plan to try and implement um, a bring your own technology plan at Higley High School. As you know, with um, everything new and trying to be in innovative and looking at how to best use our dollars, we're, we're trying to do new things. And so I've uh, asked Principal Diab to be able to explain it. She's the hands-on with the whole program. So I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Diab so she can explain it in detail. Thank you. All right, President Reese, members of the board, cabinet, and the fabulous community, happy Valentine's Day. All right, this is going to be nice and quick, which I have to tell you a funny story. Our little Brady up there, he gave me my very first Valentine's today. Isn't that so sweet? All right, our purpose. We are pleased to be able to provide our Bring Your Own Technology to Hegley High School, and the intention of it is, again, the instructional strategies that we can utilize within the classroom. So if you look at we want to use it in a supportive, uh, meaningful way and a responsible way, again, actually a continuation. I really enjoyed the media specialist presentation because it really is a continuation of what they are starting at the elementary school what we're doing at the middle schools with our iPads and then continuing on to the high schools. Um, on average, the educational merit for it is the higher student engagement. When you walk in our classrooms, the kids are on their computers, either they're working together, they're doing research, and it helps um, really when we're looking at differentiated instruction, all of our students are special education students, whether they're our self-contained students or our SLD students, bring in their own technology and be able to utilize it within the classroom with either their modified curriculum or any curriculum that has accommodations and it's right there for them. Um, some of the other uh, abilities are, is that better? Do you need my hand on? Sorry, I thought I was talking to you. Um, for our world language departments and what they can do with translations, with the writing, with their um, presentations, they truly enjoy working with the technology there. 
our students, as you know, are in that age where they want it right then and there. If technology's at their fingertips, whether it's with their phone or whether it's with an iPad or a laptop, and they can navigate it. Um, it allows our teachers, again, within the language to focus on specific standards. They're able to use Kahoot, love it. Oh my gosh, I, I know some of you guys use it. Kahoot? Say that again? Do you give prizes with Kahoot? I can't hear you. Do you give prizes? Um, I don't know. No, we don't have to. Oh, they give prizes at CGCC? Oh. Yeah, we need a prize. You're going to have to get me some from CGCC. Yeah, we'll I'll give it out. Okay. Um, again, when we talk about differentiated instruction, it's so easy to do so that if we need to send it out to a student, that student next to them might not know that they're, they might be working on something that's a little bit different. Again, with our special um, needs students, they have it right there at their fingertips. Um, practicing soft skills, typing, um, research, and students always have, like, have their assignments and projects right at their fingertips. Um, presentational speaking, again, we've got Kahoot in there for some reason twice. It's beneficial for listening and typing, um, our writing skills, and it allows kids to interswitch with their computer so that if they're doing peer evaluations, all they have to do is hand over the, um, the laptop or their iPad to someone else. They can go through highlight where they need to make changes, switch it back. It just it's so much simpler than what um, you can do sometimes with the paper and pencil. Um, some of the negatives, some of the kids don't want to bring their own devices for some of the classes. If one student doesn't bring their device, the instructor sometimes might have to bring up a backup activity or have uh, one of the carts in there. Um, students struggling with the Wi-Fi connection, this one's probably the biggest one for us. So what we discovered yes, or last year at the end of the year when we tested all of our kiddos on Galileo and on um, AZ Merit, is the access points to get everybody on certain access points, it causes it to slow down tremendously. So kids, again, wanting that instant gratification not, not, and not wanting to wait. Remember our old AOL dot, yeah. They whip out their phones and it's a little bit easier for them to get that information with their own data plan. And so recommendations for the future, the high quality Wi-Fi access points, it's gonna be what we need to do uh, if we want to continue, bring your own technology, and if I can, if I want to implement it truly school wide, and as, especially since we continue to grow in um, our student population, and continue training to help teachers incorporate more technology into their lessons for student engagement. So, Miss Gabe, can I Done. ask? So, it's so it's high quality, uh, more Wi-Fi access. I know that's you, that's a wish, but is that is that going to be happening? Do you have any promises? Any plans? For improvements, okay. Um, that's a great question. Uh, prior to work study, we reviewed obviously Ms. Dieb's presentation in cabinet. It was one of the things that we, we discussed during cabinet. We have to bring in, we want to bring in Chuck Kelly, we want to bring in Robbie. We want to look at what is the feasibility and, and the cost, to be quite honest, of ramping up the system, putting in more access points and, and things of that nature. So to answer your question, that's something that we, we are going to bring to cabinet, um, have those conversations, and probably bring that information back to the school board at some time. But we wanted to give Ms. Diab the opportunity to get this program moving in our school, look at the program, because she is kind of the one that's spearheading it, and then bring, bring us back the feedback that we need to move further and better, just like any teacher and learning model. Just oh, one second. I'd just like to applaud you for the initiative. And um, February 8th on um, Education Magazine, I was reading an article about s exactly what you're doing. And the three things they said to be successful, you hit two of them. Okay. Um, <laughs> recommendations, I'm impressed with you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it was, have, you wanted to have a successful program board had before they implemented the program they were talking about is to have a uh, rank of high quality Wi-Fi at the at your school. And the other thing was the training of the teachers, that's that one. The third thing that they put is the students that don't have access to technology, there was a room or somewhere that these students could go get borrow that equipment for that particular day. And that's that's the third one. So I'm a little 
Absolutely. Um, that, that, that take about three weeks. Um, it's kids that don't have access, you know, what are we doing for them? And like, so, you know, I think you mentioned in one of the things, if one student doesn't bring something, then teacher has to be creative. Well, let's have that resource for that student. That might be something with some donations or grants that, in fact, this article um, says there's grants out there where we can get some of this equipment. And uh, that might be something I'll, I'll share the article send you with that you. Article. I'll send you the article because it's you. everything. You're right on target. I'm so totally impressed with you. Oh, thank <laughs> but, you. Uh, thank you. In reference to this, but that, that would be one of the things we might want to look for equipment. Yes. And yes, and we need to crank up that Wi-Fi. Excellent. So I was going to ask a couple questions. Um, now that you've been doing it for a while, what seems to what seems to be their device of choice? Accessibility, probably still their cell phones. Okay. Um, because of the connectability, are they still using it, or have have oh, they they're still kind using of it. Yeah, no, they're definitely still using it. If you walk into my classroom, um, you'll see kids. So, for example, the student that I had up on there that was walking into Miss Lee's calculus class, and you notice some of the other kids were writing in their interactive notebooks. He was taking all of his notes through Evernote on his uh, iPad. So it really is again depends on the student. My goal would be, as you guys know, we do the binders and we do the interactive notebooks as part of our Avid school wide. Um, System. I'd love at some point, I was actually just talking about this with a new teacher, to move to the e-binder and be able to work with it so that everything's right there and for the kids so we're not carrying the 30-pound backpacks and all of that. I'd love to move to there. But it, it, it's just going to take some time and baby steps and get there. Go to the electronic right, right? binders, huh? <laughs> Instead of the 4-inch binders, 3-inch binders. The other question I had for you was um, if they're using their cell phones, one, I'm sorry, there are certain cell phone companies, carriers that don't have very adequate um, coverage in this area. And I think that that can cause a problem. And the other is um, at one point I think Cell phones had gone to free unlimited data plans, and now they're kind of going back to limited data plans. And I guess my concern is if it's creating an issue for families because kids are exceeding data limitations, um, then that there's a financial impact there. So I, I think that's my other concern with. So, and teachers are very cognizant of that, of when they need to, if it's a large project, it, they're not doing a quick clicker activity or a Kahoot activity, that they're going into the labs if it needs to be a whole group project. So it's not, I promise you, they're not sitting there for like an hour, six hours in every single class. And I love Kahoot. <laughs> it's fun. So do the kids. <laughs> well, one, to, um, one of the other things real quick is, um, What's nice about this program is that students are learning on things that they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. You know, if they have a certain type of technology at home and then they come to school and it's something totally different, they're bringing something they're more comfortable with. So that's the other plus side to bringing some technology to the um, school setting. To piggyback on uh, President Reese's question, one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to see how this year unfolded as we start to look at options possibly to work with HP to find out, to lower our cost points, so we might be able to offer a, a four or a five year lifespan device for maybe $179, which when you look at the fees we're paying at the middle schools every year, we're paying a $50 fee for a year that we're paying for a We wanted to see how they would handle that. We had some conversations with Cabinet and Mr. Kelly on can we strike a deal with HP that way it would kind of mimic some of the things we have and that is a conversation that's ongoing with us to different plans and somebody getting used to a device if you you have a device and you use it all through high school then you just buy the upgrade device and you go on to the university so to answer both your questions we have kind of thought through it but I don't think we're quite there yet thank you Everything?
coaching is a learning journey. It's yeah, all about it's that. It's a journey. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I just, oh. yeah, sorry, I always Robert. have something to add. Sorry, I know it's Valentine's Day. I'm sorry. Um, but there, you know, you can you can get uh, refurbished um, routers and switches too that are that are very functional for schools chiefly. Um, I know people. <laughs> um, but also, I, I don't know if you're aware, uh, but donors choose is a pretty good one, and the Fiesta Bowl will come through. And I've had teachers, just on a whim, that weren't even technolo technology folks, and they've put in for an entire card of Chromebooks and wireless printers, and somebody will just come through from somewhere in the country and fund these things. And if we could just get a teacher to be successful with one of those, then, then it sort of grows from there. And it's a really thousands and thousands of dollars you could get for your school very, very easily. It, I can't believe people do it, but they, they're generous people throughout the world. And then um, I also wanted to remind you, and you can talk to Dr. Madeline, we would love to have some of your best teachers join us at SETI. It is free, and uh, if you pick your best ones, I don't know how you incentivize them to go, but it is two days. It will be well worth their while. Um, I can talk to you more about it if you if you wish, but there is there are spots, and we would love to have more secondary people from Higley with us. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Diaz Scott, for your presentation. Um, it's funny because my oldest, as you know her well, um, two things that she wanted me to do on the board as a board member, and one was a four-day school week, which I failed, and the other was better Wi-Fi at Higley. Like, it is a daily, daily frustration at times. So, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> I think I want to thank Ms. Diab for her presentation. Uh, slide five was repetitive. That was my mistake, and thanks for cut and paste and make it clear I didn't delete the slide. So I wanted to make sure you guys knew that was me. It wasn't Ms. Dib. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And now we will go on to our 100th day enrollment numbers. Members of the board, Mr. Grandy, thank you for staying. Um, I'm excited to bring you some of our 100th day enrollment numbers. We, we do have some growth in the district, and so we want to take a look at where that's at and what's happening with the district with student enrollment, including withdrawals. So this is our 100th day enrollment numbers, January 17th, uh, 2017. The reason why the 100th day uh, number is so important is because of the way funding works. Okay? After the 100th day, we're not paid for those students. And so generally we look at the 100th day as a standard across districts uh, for, for Arizona. And so that's why we, we picked the 100th day and that's what is the standard for payment for school enrollment. And so you can see that last year uh, on our 100th day, we had an enrollment of uh, 12,109. And then uh, this year we have a student enrollment of 12,454. So we have approximately 330 students. So let's take a look at that where they're at, where we were last year, and where we're going this year. You can see the, the elementary schools at the top, schools uh, near the bottom, and then the high schools at the bottom. So uh, the Bridges Elementary School grew by the most. That was 161 students. And then um, we took a look at, at Higley High School, grew by 82 students. That was the second most. We did have some areas of, of student loss, and that would be uh, the highest one would be Coley Middle School at minus 71 students. But the reason why Coley Middle School did lose 71 students, I want to explain that the eighth grade class of Coley Middle School last year was um, 102 students. Correct me if I'm wrong. Michelle, 102 students. Um, I want to make sure you get this right. And the incoming class going to Coley Middle School was 411 students. And so had a loss in So our loss was actually 70. We actually had a net growth of students from outside the district, 20 students. But that negative 71 does uh, look very poorly up there. But the explanation is, is the high grade class leaving point school versus the grade class from our feeder schools coming into to The 
100th day um, this year, 671 students withdrew from our schools, 1,022 students did in our schools. So what that means for our transactions, for our, our enrollment personnel, our high school um, counselors, and everybody that has it, that was 1,693 tran transactions since July 1st of, of this current school year. So withdrawal data, where are these students going? Okay, we can take a look at, at the schools that, that they were at and um, how many students have withdrawn. And then this shows you uh, the approximate totals, uh, the actual exact totals uh, across the district from July 1st um, to January 24th of this year. And where are they going? So taking a look at the, the withdrawal code, Codes of W1 W21. Um, a lot of those codes aren't used. Um, we have open enrollment to a non-district school uh, outside of outside the Higley boundaries. That's 22 students. Uh, students leaving the Higley district going to charter schools would be 145 students. A change in custody. Maybe there's a there's a marriage change in students going to live with mom or dad into a different address. That's 12 students. Students that moved out of the district 197. Unknown was 46. We do get those numbers later on. But at the time they withdraw, sometimes they may not have stated exactly where they're going at this time. Um, specialized programs, students that may have, have been incarcerated or go to a special school or go to um, an, a parochial school or something of that nature, that was six students. The one, when, when putting this presentation together that I was shocked about was the number of students leaving our program to go to online education. That was 65 students that we've had this year leave uh, the Higley Unified School District to go take some kind of online education program. We did have uh, three students that left to be homeschooled and eight students going to, to private schools um, outside of the district boundaries. Um, you can see the students that were, that were expelled, students that ended service. In the service would be those students that are in special education that age out. Um, we have to, to care for students and their educational opportunities up until the age of 22. If you got a student that's severe or profound, as soon as they hit the age 22, then they must leave the public school system and go to another, uh, another agency to, to have their cares taken, taken into account. Um, we did have a lot of students that graduated, and so we're, we're happy with that. Those are probably our second year seniors or students that graduated early. So if you were behind on credits, um, then, then um, they, they left for that reason. Uh, other students that, that decided to go to a homeschool, which would be a different category from the, from the, the one above, for those 12 students. We had five students obtain their GED, and then we had 130 students that did move out of state or out of the country. So real quick on that, yes. online, do we have more information on that? I mean, is it, is the majority of them high school students? Where are we losing yeah. elementary students? President Reese, members of the board, I do have each individual student that I can take a look at and take a look at a pivot table. I can tell you that the majority of students that we're losing are high school students, and the one online high school that a majority of the students are going to is Primavera. Okay, and we know their budget for advertising is in the millions of dollars, and you see all of them. Uh, I can also tell you that uh, a more majority of those students going to Primavera, you can look up online for their graduation. The very oh, no. the number of students that are that are leaving to go to um, to online schools aren't real successful when they go there. Um, and then also with, with the enrollment, you'll see students that come back in that aren't successful with that. And so we do get quite a few of those students back. Unfortunately, when we get them back, they're probably uh, a little bit further behind than when they left because uh, you have to be a very special individual to have the endurance and the self-motivation to succeed in an online uh, school as a high school student. Now, could some of those numbers be skewed a little bit if for one of our students to attend Primavera, they have to withdraw from our district before they can attend. Could 
President Reese, some I, of the I would like to correct that. You don't. You you can with an online school. You can you can have the concurrent enrollment because they could enroll in one Primavera class while still being enrolled, and so those numbers may be skewed in that aspect. That they may still be um, a Higley student in some aspects and still take a Primavera class. Well, our kids had always been told if they were taking a summer school class with Primavera, they have to disenroll and re-enroll. I, so, I, I okay. don't believe that that's correct. I think you can take a, uh, an online class at uh, the same time you're enrolled. Okay. Currently with well, the then district. I guess that answers my question. Like I said, my high school students, the, their friends have always been told if you're going to take any summer school classes on, on an online program, you have to withdraw from Higley before you enroll with them. So that's why I was wondering if that data could be skewed if anyone chose to take a winter class over break to do a makeup and credit. But if that's not the requirement, then I guess that answers my question, then that's probably not skewed. Uh, unfortunately, um, some of the kids that go to the online classes um, in the summertime with some of the online programs do take a portion of our previous year funding and then a portion of our next year funding. And so um, some of the information that, that we get is I apologize. Maybe enrolled in one of our classes and then finish a class that they had previously enrolled in on Primavera because a lot of the classes are online that are open entry, open exit type classes. Yeah, Primavera has figured this out. Because you only get so much money per year per student and they try to grab the most money first, right? That's correct, yeah. Mr. Glover. Uh, on some aspects, a uh, student take uh, a summer class at the beginning of the summer with Primavera and pull off a point two five ADM from Primavera for summer one and then after July one enroll in another class at Primavera and pull off another point two five ADM from Primavera or another online uh, class for summer two and then when they come to the Higley Unified School District there's only point five funding left and so we will have them for six classes for the remainder of the year at point five funding. Now the exciting part, the enrollment data. So where are the students coming from? This is a little bit more difficult to figure out because sometimes the records don't catch up or we don't have complete records. Um, but this is what we have uh, in our system that tells us uh, essentially where the students may have come from. We've had 379 come from out of state or out of country. We've had eight students return from home school. We've had 34 students return from online schools. We've had 31 students come in from private placement. Um, that could be a parochial school, that could be a, a private school, incarceration, that could be many different things. We also have um, 388 students that came to the district from, um, from another district. We did uh, increase the number of students from charter schools to 167 students came to us from charter schools. Uh, we had two changes of custody and seven of them are unknown at this time because we haven't received the records yet. We also want to take a look at where our open enrollments are at. Um, as you can see, the Bridges number one has 356 students that are on open enrollment at the highest level. And then uh, the lowest level would be at the, the Cooley Middle School with 65 students that are open enrollment. And I did break that out for how many are in district open enrollment and how many districts, how many students come from out of district. So we have over a thousand students that come from outside of the district to take Finally, we we'll want to take a look at projected enrollment for the 8-19 school year. Um, these are just straight roll-up numbers. We know that roll-up numbers aren't always as correct as we, we can have them, but we took straight roll-up numbers with doubling the kindergarten students that we have within our districts, and it looks like that we might have uh, an increase in enrollment uh, to uh, 
13,265. We know that's a high projection because we know there's an attrition rate at the high school levels and at the, at the middle school levels for students taking some of those different uh, um, options for, for educational opportunities. At this time, I wanted to see if you had any questions. Um, we do have some, some marketing that's going on, so um, this will be another board presentation coming to you um, in the month of April. And then um, Michelle Reese is excited to bring in Grand Canyon University and talk to us about all of, our, all of our marketing opportunities that we have within the district. So at this time, I'd like to take any questions you might have. Thanks, Dr. Thompson, um, Madam President. Uh, I just, it's good information. It's good data. I like looking at it. Uh, did you, have you shared and, and then talked about this with the other administrators? Because I, I, I'm sure they would find value in seeing these numbers and looking at these trends as well, yeah? I'm not sure what's going on. It, it just it just cuts off on me and and just won't won't continue. So yeah, absolutely, we go over the the numbers with our administrators on a regular basis. We want to take a look if there's any trends, especially going from sixth grade to seventh grade and going from um, the eighth grade to to the high school level. That we want to make sure that we follow those trends and find out where we're losing. And, and then uh, I have talked to, uh, to many parents on a regular basis to find out um, what their choices are and why they're leaving our district, especially if they're going to a charter school um, within our district or a charter school just outside our boundaries. And, then, and I have gotten several different reasons. A lot of them is, is for um, personal reasons, that the family lives closer to the school, that they have friends and other relatives that go to those schools. But we do have those. You have the pivot table that shows exactly uh, where every student is coming from and every student is going. We can break it down to the individual student level and, and contact those parents to find out what we can do better as a school district to support them. Dr. Thomason, we're, we're going to have a presentation in reference to the marketing on this in the near future. Yes, sir. Sure. It's, it's just because I, I look at the um, reference to the numbers. We have Cooley Middle School, which is in the middle of a high growth rate. If you look out the window, of buildings taking place out there so so that number concerns me with all the growth that we're having around Cooley Middle School even though the numbers of students in sixth grade there's less than the number of eighth graders leaving there's still with this group of housing that's moving out this still being should be in place and, and I look at we have another school an elementary school we have a specialized program at that school and the numbers are down so are we looking at the, the intense marketing to take a look at this and Absolutely, especially at, at the middle school and the high school and the northern boundaries. The northern boundaries is the area that we're taking a look at where we're losing most of our students to, uh, to charter schools or to other school districts. And so we're intentionally marketing uh, the northern school districts, the northern schools within our district, especially Williamsfield High School and Cooley Middle School. That is something we, we look at on a, on a regular basis. And uh, if you follow social media, some of the, the southern schools have, have not been happy with us because we do... Uh, market our northern schools more and there's a reason for that is because that we want to make sure that uh, the community knows all the great options and opportunities we have at our schools and that's where we're having the, the most student loss. And I just wanted to clarify that we are having marketing presentation in April but that's just to let us know what we're already doing. We are already doing this because come in April, if we're not already moving, we're late. So it's just to let us know what's out there, correct? That is absolutely correct. Um, we, we've started the marketing, and especially for uh, the northern schools within our district and the middle and high schools. So we make sure that we capture those kids and we present them with the options that are available within the district and the great opportunities. I would, I would take the Higley Unified School Districts and put it up against any charter school or any other public school in, in the state because we're doing a phenomenal job and, and comparably we have more to offer than any of those other schools. Thank you. I would like more information though about the online numbers because I do find that very interesting. I don't necessarily want specifics, I just more so on 
grade levels that we may be losing, so maybe we can take a look at that and see if we're missing something. Absolutely. Um, probably not for this week, but I will definitely get that put together and, and tell you what grade levels. I'll put together a pivot table that we can take a look at and see exactly what grade levels and what schools that we're losing students for the online. I, w I was also surprised by the number of students we're losing to online education opportunities. I just wanted to say, um, according to my numbers, I think those who went to charter school less than 1.2, less than 1.2 percent of our entire population. So I feel like sometimes, for me personally, maybe not for the other members of the board, I feel like that's kind of the, the boogeyman. You know, oh, all, all our students are going to charter schools, and it seems like the numbers don't bear that out. And I just want to say, well done to you, but honestly, probably more to the teachers, the frontline teachers, because as we've seen tonight, that relationship means so much to the students, and so. Just my hat, my hat goes off to everyone who's been here. That's just a phenomenal job. Thank you, Mr. Cronk. I, I would absolutely agree. We have um, some of the best teachers in the state, and that without a doubt, and we need to, to value them and take care of our teachers. With that comment, I, I don't want to minimize the fact that people are leaving, and I, I appreciate the focus. I think we're all focused on every last student, trying to meet everyone's needs. And so, I also think we've seen both sides, you know, large numbers, but wanting to cater to to everyone to do the best we can for our community. So thank you again. One of the difficult things we have with some of our charter school students is, is uh, unfortunately, some of the charter school students that come into our district, um, we, we do have a very high expectation academically for our students. And some of the charter school students that come in, if they, if they come in at, at a grade level that is much higher than what they're used to, uh, unfortunately, we do lose them back to charter schools because of the academic rigor and expectations we have within our district. You can't take a look at those students that come in from charter schools and those same students are going back to charter schools because uh, of our high academic rigor. And, and I've talked to those parents personally and I've talked to those students and I've talked to those teachers. And, it, and it's something that we're taking a look at to see how we can accommodate those students coming in from charter schools to keep them here. But, but it's a difficult situation for those students that come in um, from a charter school and they thought they were great, they were doing uh, great work getting A's on the report card and they come into the Higby di district with higher expectations and higher rigor and all of a sudden they, they may be a, a, a C student and so that does not make parents or students very happy. Thank you. Thank you. And then we will go on to our preschool budget update. I have typically recused myself when it comes to preschool. This is just a budget update. It's not, there's no request coming. There's, there's not going to be a vote on any of this information. It is just a budget update. So I won't be leaving. I will be staying for this presentation. Center people across the board. It's not just specified, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. it cuts in and out for everybody, even right. the superintendent. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, good evening, President. Members of the board, Dr. Thompson, Cabinet. Um, who just told me you cook? Huh? Yes, ma'am. Biscuits. Better? No. Hear me now? Okay, we'll try this again. So, yes, I do have, we have jokes for you tonight. So, we come prepared. Um, they both have Valentine's themes, of course. So, why shouldn't you fall in love with a pastry chef on Valentine's Day? Give me something. Because he's going to desert you. 
And the second one, how did the telephone propose to his girlfriend on Valentine's Day? He gave her a ring. Very good. <laughs> Those okay? Good. So now we got the important stuff out of the way. <laughs> so tonight we'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, the preschool program. We know recently um, Ms. Gleason did come and give a presentation on her schools and the, uh, the growth and the progress that she has made um, over the last three years. So tonight, what Justin and I have put together to come talk is based on the revenue and her expenditures over the last three years to, to kind of support and show how she has grown. Her pro that program has grown. as a whole. Um, in, as it goes for the expenditures, we do track those by site, so we do know what's being spent at Saucman. We do know what's being spent at the Cooley sites as well. Uh, the items that we're currently charging to those programs or that budget includes or encompasses all of the payroll expenses, so the compensation for the staff, their benefits, um, and then we're also charging any bank service expenses because we do a large volume of our collection for the tuition online, so we do charge that to the program. Um, any travel or conference expenses and then supplies that are for, for the program as well. But currently what's not included in the budget uh, that the district is currently budgeting for, um, those items would include the building lease payments, or at least the allocation for the space that they're using at the buildings. Um, also the utilities, including the energy use, the water, and then the traffic lights itself are all cur currently paid for by the district. In terms of space, each building is a carbon copy of the other, so um, as of right now, each preschool program is using 28,700 square feet of each building out of the entire 139,000, equating to approximately 20.68% square footage. So pretty much what that would mean is that the preschool program would be responsible for paying for those portions of those expenses if they were off-site or not using those, those buildings. So what we put together is a uh, breakdown from the last three years, 15, 16, 16, 17, and the current year through December. Um, the costs for each of those sites, uh, the total utilities, and then using the space that they're using, the 28.68%, breaking out what the allocation would be for those programs. So for instance, the utilities in 15, 16, uh, we would have originally charged $94,000 to the preschool program that year. And then from the total lease payments, as you see below, uh, we paid as a district three million two thirty eight one zero five twenty nine. Uh, the preschool at that point would have been allocated six hundred eighty thousand of that payment. Um, and as you can see, or sixteen seventeen, very similar numbers. And then for seventeen eighteen, we're about halfway through the year, so those numbers are about half. Also, to just add to that, um, you'll notice that our lease payment it says two of four. So we, may, we do make those payments in court every quarter. So uh, right now our total as a whole is 6.2, so right now we're at about 1.6. Okay. Um, just to kind of add a little bit more, so the, the total utility for the schools as a whole this year, or last year, was um, 215,492, and that Sossman was 254,786. Um, again, basing that off of their 20.68, um, the cost would have been approximately $97,000 to the program that the district has been covering that expense. So this slide here, we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to show you currently what the project is, what the balances are, in the first column where it says current. To the right, we wanted to include what the balance would look like if we included the utilities and the lease allocation. Um, the beginning rollover balance was from the 14-15 year. The 
imbalance was 313,000 for the preschool program. The revenues they brought in uh, were 1,675,366,42, and their expenditures that were charged to the program were 1,592,717,80. They had an excess of 142,648,52. In the current process, they rolled that over, so it, the 313 and the 142 totals the 456, 585, 32. However, looking to the right, you'll notice if we charge the utilities and lease allocation, the ending balance would have been in the red $307,000. If we carried that over to the 2016-17 year, they start off in the current budget for 456,000. The revenues were 1,681,995,94. Expenditures were 1,600,455.90. They had excess of 81,540.04. That would have given them an ending balance of 538,125.36. Moving over to the right, to include the utilities and lease allocation, same information um, carries over the 307 in the red, the excess of 81,000 for the year, Utilities 97,253.52, the lease allocation of 669,608.06, and then their ending balance would have been $192,000. And then carrying over to this year, we've included a few extra areas to, to take a look at, which I'll explain in just a minute. Um, for this year, we carried over $538,000. Uh, through December, we're at 1,297,570,86. The expenditures are at 1,102,48,33. And they have an excess currently in the program of $195,000. So as of right now, they have a balance of 733000 Moving to the second column where we do, are including the lease and the utilities currently for the year. We've rolled over the 992, 1686 negative, their excess of 195, 522, 53, the utilities for the year, and then the lease allocation thus far, giving them a 1,185, 986, negative balance. Uh, we wanted to break it out um, just as a current year if we were to, write, to wipe the slate clean, start them off at a zero balance. Uh, the excess is 195 still. And with the utilities and lease allocation, their ending balance would be 193, 148.77 in the red. The very last column is if they were to just be charged the utilities that they're using. So again, starting with a fresh slate, giving the excess of 195, covering the $53,000 in utilities, they would still have uh, an excess of 141, 673.74. So based on all of that information, they could cover the utilities, but not necessarily the lease allocation. Yes, as you can see, that would drastically leave them with a, a much smaller um, carryover into the next year. Um, and again, as you're trying to grow your program, you're going to need as, you know, as much revenue or as money as you can to start the year, especially if you're trying to grow, advertise, hire new teachers, additional staff. Um, hence why we were talking about potentially looking at increasing the tuition. So this slide here shows that what the revenue trends have looked like for the past uh, three school years. Uh, the 15-16 school year, uh, the, the monthly program billing cycle for the year ran July to April. So we billed our parents' tuition July 1 all the way through April 1, even though the school year went until the end of May we collected all of that tuition up front. Uh, the 16-17 year, we changed it up a little bit. We billed July 1. July included both July and or the last week of July and then the full month of August. And then they were billed again for September 1st. And then their last bill was May 1st. You'll see a small difference here if you look under the 15-16 column. Uh, as of May, we had only collected $12,000. But in 1617, that was 132,000. The difference in the bill, the difference in the billing cycles. For this year, we are doing a July through April cycle. 
we were going to skip August because we had parents that had mentioned that they've only been in school since July 1. And then August 1st, you're billing me again. And basically, we billed them twice before they'd been to school for a week. Um, we had some issues with the system, um, the, with processing those. Once we initiated it at the beginning of the year, it couldn't be, that, it couldn't be fixed very easily. So we ended up billing some of them again for August. We're going to see a more similar trend to the 15-16 year as well. Um, but moving forward into next year for 18-19, we're going to do July to May, and we're going to be skipping August moving forward. So in essence, uh, we've kind of been, as you can see year to year, um, trying to learn from our mistakes or what's working, what's not working, um, and we're trying to um, meet our parents' needs and concerns. So. Yes, it does look a little funny going up and down each year, um, but again, it's all a process of trying to improve. Any questions on any of that? I know there's a lot of information in there. So we kind of wanted to jump into preschool indirect costs because we have costs and we also have benefits to the program. Um, items that are paid for by preschool that we consider indirect right now are our uh, community education staff that works with the district office that handle the billing uh, and some of the scheduling for the, for the program itself. Um, other items that are approved uh, from the preschool budget uh, include any additional IT staff. We have one that's being paid from there this year for the 17-18 year. Uh, other approved expenditures include portable air conditioners and then um, other district needs when they arise. So let me just add on to that. Um, our community ed program as a whole, um, every time the district has um, needed some additional support, um, they've, they've been very willing and, so, and supportive of whatever the district needed, whether that was kids club or a preschool. Um, they, you know, when I have a situation where we need some money, I call them and, uh, and I ask both of them, um, and they're both always very willing to help however they can. Hence, you'll notice the additional IT staff so this year we increased three additional IT staff to help meet our demand. Um, and Karen was very um, supportive as well as Patty. Each of them took one, um, supported one FTE, and then the additional one took the other. So thank you to both of you um, for that. As well as we had a situation where we had um, our air conditioners continuously going down um, and the, the demand of trying to keep up with all of that as well as keep all of our students cool and warm and you know, all at the same time, we needed to buy some, some portable air conditioners so that we could at least put them in the rooms to keep everything going until we were able to come up with the money to cover those costs. And again, they were both very gracious and helped with that. Some of the additional costs that are indirect in nature that we're currently not uh, being charged to the preschool, of course, we have our you know custodial, we have um, finance, human resources support, maintenance, as well as payroll. All of those expenses are indirect in nature. However, those programs do benefit by that expense, and that is an expense that the district currently um, covers. You'll notice the last bullet, it talks about the district considering trying to establish or develop an overhead or an indirect cost rate, um, a rate or a percentage that we were able to determine to assess to our programs You'll notice with our, for example, our federal programs allow for an indirect cost rate. Um, however, that rate drastically fluctuates from year to year. In the past, you could have 8% one year and you could have zero the next. Um, this year, um, our rate is 2%, but that is only um, for against our federal programs. For all of our other programs, um, it's, it's nothing. And so in an attempt to try to help meet some of the district's needs and demands. Um, that is something that we really are trying to consider looking into and determining what kind of rate that might look like. Does that make sense? Taking more indirect, um, the, the preschool program does a great job at retaining our families, our, our students and our parents, especially ones that do come out of district as we've seen. Um, and by retaining those out of district students, that um, you know, that result in additional state aid to the district. Um, we just have a few numbers here. Um, from the 16-17 year, 
for the 17, or I'm sorry, the 79 students that were enrolled in the preschool program that were out of district, 25 of them enrolled in this plan for the following year. Uh, that year, the ADM, as you can see, is 3,60109. dollars However, for kindergartners, we only get half of that. So the district would have benefited indirectly um, as a result of 46000 that year. And then for this year, uh, 64 students who enrolled in the preschool program last year, 24 of them stayed within the district this year. Uh, and with the ADM this year of 3,729.31, uh, we, re we had an indirect benefit of approximately 44,751.72. Also keep in mind that the state does not fund our regular preschool program. They only fund um, exceptional student services preschool, right? So our preschool program has to be completely um, self-sustaining to make it work. And then as we were just explaining, because of that, then those students, those that stay with the district, benefit um, financially going down, going forward. Does that make sense? Any questions, thoughts, comments? President Reese, members of the board, um, I would like to, to just state that one of the reasons why we brought this forward is for some of those new board members that haven't been here for the five years is that the um, preschools were brought on to help make the lease payments and so that is something that was very important to keep in mind. Although the preschools, I believe, are doing a phenomenal job, I don't want to you know, uh, paint this picture of doom and gloom that we're losing money in preschools because we're um, making money in preschools when you figure that regardless, we have to make those lease payments, um, regardless whether there's preschools or sitting empty or not empty. Um, but the, the reason for this was to give you a full picture and hopefully more information um, about the full cost. It's not an easy picture. Some things you can't split hairs on. We can't measure how much electricity the preschool is using compared to the rest of the school because they're on the same you know, electric, electric meter. Um, we can't split hairs on exactly how much supplies the preschool is using for cleaning as compared to the others. But we wanted to give you a better picture of what the costs were for the preschools. And we can certainly look into this and, and cut it up and slice it uh, anyways, but hopefully this gives you a more full picture of the indirect costs that, that occur with the preschools also. But you do realize that preschoolers use more toilet paper than middle schoolers. <laughs> Just saying. And then you have to unclog the toilet because they use the whole roll. That's Patty's job. Because <laughs> I have... <laughs> because of what I do. I'm the one going and unclogging all the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> President Reese, um, I, I appreciate your comments, uh, Dr. Thomason, and that was kind of my question when I saw the allocations. My first thought was, where does this compare as far as a market rate? You know, if I, I don't know if we're allowed to sublease that out, but hypothetically, I'd like to go through that exercise. What if we were to scrap this program, sublease it out to some private company, and then generate revenue just to see what the market rates were. And that's, that's more of like an exercise that you can do over the summer when you're bored. But um, <laughs> I'm more interested in tracking the, so on the indirect information, this slide, students enrolled in kindergarten the next year, I'd love to track the following year, first grade, because I, I believe it creates, I believe the value of this program creates an adhesion to the district year over year. And so I think to cut it off after kindergarten doesn't show the true picture, kind of like what we were talking, what you mentioned earlier. And so I'd love to see that, that revenue come in. In addition, I would love to see students who kind of pertain, so not out of districts, in district students at the preschool level who then continue year after year because we just finished talking about the 100 day numbers, alternatives, and I, I firmly believe if they start in preschool here in Higley, they'll continue at least, I'd love to see as far as we can, fourth grade or something, I mean obviously there's gonna be natural uh, ebbing and flowing, if you will, of the numbers, but th that's what I would love to see that in the future. Um, I don't know if it's possible to aggregate that, but that's well, we'll, we'll look at it and see what we can come up with. Great job, by the way. Thank you for this. <laughs> <laughs> Thumbs up. Uh, I just want to thank you for um, always presenting numbers that can be so overwhelming to me in such a great way. I mean, I just think you guys are phenomenal in. Um, bottom shelfing it for this 
mind that doesn't remember that. Um, also, I, I remember too, Dr. Thomason, when um, the preschools were presented, I think the word was a cash cow. And um, it has not been a cash cow. It, it has been phenomenal for our community, and I love everything about our preschools, but um, that was not, that has not come to fruition. So I understand now why, um, and your ears, um, why increases were brought to us because what has come or what was promised us has not yet to come. So um, I appreciate you guys breaking this down for us so we can see those exact numbers. Thank you, well done. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, what some people don't understand, like Mrs. Kaler said, that preschools are million dollar businesses and it will pay our lease payments and, and everything else. Um, preschool is no different than education and it's still all about the funding, it's just a different source and it's a fine balance. I'm not getting into that conversation of your income and your expenses and determining what's affordable and what's not and um, but you have to be able to sustain and so I appreciate you putting this together. Um, kind of fun sometimes to play with the hypothetical going, ooh, that's not what it really is, thankfully, but if we, if we had to, like Mr. Thornot said, you know, if we had to put all those indirect costs, I, that money's gotta come from somewhere. So I'm glad at the moment that we can support our programs and give them what they need and, um, continue to look at, at serving our kids because that's what preschool is about is preparing them for the for kindergarten and for um, their long time in education. So um, I appreciate everything you guys do and I know how hard it is. <laughs> so um, thank you for putting this together so it has a better picture of the total cost of our of our preschool program. putting this all together for you guys. Um, it, it was starting even on a Sunday when I'm like, Justin, you have to start on this. And he was planning to go to the movies. And I'm like, no, no, you got to get started. <laughs> so <laughs> during a whole conversation in the movie, um, he said, OK, I'll get on as soon as I get home. So thank you, Justin, for all of your hard work. We appreciate and value you very much. Thank you. And I, I just have one more, Mayor President Reese. I'm looking at these these numbers, Ms. Gleason, and maybe maybe I'm dense, but um, 2016, 79 kids, and then 25 stayed for kindergarten. But are there are there kids that stay for two years in? Okay, so okay, this that makes better sense to me. Do you guys understand what I'm asking there? Yeah. Are you okay. on a particular page? That works better. Thank you. Are those that? A good question. Is that 79 in the pre-K program, or is that? I'm assuming that we have more than 79 out of district, don't we? Was that specifically in the kinder prep? Okay, so specifically in the kinder prep program to go on, not including the youngers. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate Thank it. You. All right. And with that, we will conclude our work study. All the, or, uh, I move that we adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Have a good evening. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>